everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Before uh, we begin today's episode, I'd like to remind you that Catholic Culture is in the middle of its Easter fundraising campaign. We do two major fundraising campaigns uh, every year, um, and the Easter one is usually the one that sort of gets us through the summer because summertime is always a time of uh, decreased donations. Uh, so in order to keep catholicculture.org going, which includes not just our four podcasts, but a lot of written material, commentary, news, uh, liturgical uh, year information, things like that, uh, we really need to make this donation goal, which as it happens, uh, some generous uh, key donors have offered us a $60,000 challenge grant, a matching challenge grant, which means that any time, uh, any donation you make, between now and Pentecost Sunday, which I think is June 5th, something like that, if I'm not mistaken, uh, will be doubled. So this is the best time of year, uh, this or and or I should say uh, Advent are the best times of year to donate because we usually have some such matching grant. But if we don't make that $60,000 mark, we're not going to get any of it doubled. So we have to make that mark. So please, if you enjoy this podcast, consider donating. We do pray for our benefactors every day. And if you'd like your donation to go uh, directly to our podcast programming, you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. I'm really happy to be speaking with today's guest um, because... A, uh, he's a poet that I've been uh, reading and admiring over the past few years, and also because he's one of a number of people that I met at a, a Catholic arts conference a few years ago that uh, I've, they've all become sort of important guests on this podcast, and, and this guest today is the last one that I haven't gotten around to having on yet, mainly because I've just been slowly reading through his work and waiting for the right time. So I'm really happy to to have the poet and translator uh, Ryan Wilson on the show. Ryan is the editor of Literary Matters, which is the online literary journal of the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics, and Writers. He teaches at the Catholic University of America, and is the, he's the author of a number of books. Um, his volume of original poetry, The Stranger World, his uh, booklet essay from Wise Blood Books, How to Think Like a Poet, and most recently, and the, the main occasion for this interview, is uh, his new book of translations from Franciscan University Press, uh, Proteus Bound, a, a collection of dozens of translations from uh, several different languages, from uh, ancient Greece and Rome to modern France. Really, really excellent uh, volume. Uh, so I'm really happy to, uh, to welcome Ryan Wilson to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for having me. So we met back in 2019, and under somewhat memorable and quite fun for me circumstances, which is that we were at um, a Catholic arts conference, as I mentioned, and it was, I think, the last evening of the conference, if I'm not mistaken, and there was a, an awards banquet, a poetry awards banquet, and they were giving the award to this horrible, blasphemous poet uh, that that I had some previous familiar <laughs> familiarity with and distaste for, and uh, I was trying to find people to hang out with, and uh, uh, so uh, James Matthew Wilson, our mutual friend who's been on this podcast many times, um, invited me to join you and him uh, going to a nearby sports bar to watch. I actually don't remember some football game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was happening. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, so we went to the sports bar instead and uh, watched the the football game and talked about poetry and other things uh, in between uh, plays. And so <laughs> that was quite a fun conclusion for the conference uh, for me. Yeah, no, I, I have no idea what the game was and, and it didn't matter and, and no one cares. You know, I, football is an excuse to sit in proximity <laughs> to, to other people and just talk. Uh, you know. Good. I'm glad you agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was that was fun. And uh, I definitely enjoyed speaking with you then. And I uh, shortly after getting home, I picked up The Stranger World, your first volume of original poems and was kind of reading through that and enjoying it uh, at a slow pace ever since then until I finished it a couple months ago. And then uh, this new collection came out and I thought I have to talk to him about this. Um, and, and gosh, I really, I was so impressed with the scope of this, uh, this collection Proteus Bound, um, 
not only in terms of subject matter of the poetry, but the the range of languages, um, the verse forms, and and the musicality of the poetry. I'm not really an expert in um, in poetry and uh, certainly in its interpretation, uh, but I am a musician, and so I do hook into that aspect of poetry and your poem is your poetry is very musical and it's also uh not only uh it's it's formally musical and it's it's got plenty of rhyme and stuff but also there's i noticed there's a lot of alliteration too which i appreciate because i do like that sort of anglo-saxon <laughs> element of english poetry so it's kind of like you're you're so reliable in providing alliteration in many of your lines that it's almost like got the best of both worlds of sort of modern english formal verse and anglo-saxon verse well that's that's the goal certainly is is to combine you know english as a hybrid language uh we have obviously the the Anglo-Saxon roots, and we should we should separate the Anglo-Saxons were not a people. There were the Angles and the Saxons, and there were the Picts and the Jutes, and they all made war on the Celts and made war on each other. And all this is happening in England, and so it's it's very hybrid language. And then of course uh, William of Normandy in, in 1066 comes over and earns his nickname of William the Conqueror, and so the French conquer the English and bring in the romance aspect, right? The, the Latin uh, base language, French, which then combines with all these others. And so we end up with a hybrid language. And it's one of the great strengths of English is that it is this hybrid language. Uh, it allows a great deal of variety in how we can say things. Um, and I think, you know, good poets, uh, you know, going back to Chaucer, uh, Manage to mingle these elements. Certainly, you know, by the time we get to Shakespeare and then to the metaphysical poets, there's a an awareness about uh, how to mingle these elements into a poetic line to make a line that sounds good or to make a line that sounds bad. Um, so, yeah, you know, I I have tried to you know go to these different languages to um, find resources. For, for English, for contemporary English. And, and obviously, you know, that's one aspect of, of translating is that I can't translate a poem the way that John Dryden did in 1670 because we don't speak the way that they spoke in 1670. Uh, one has to update the language, one has to modify the language to fit into uh, as much as possible into uh, the expectations of language in one's own time while remaining faithful as much as one can uh, to the original. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, I mean, it's a tricky business. It's not a perfect business. Robert Frost famously said, poetry is what is lost in translation uh, because of <laughs> certain elements and nuances that you simply can't carry across languages. Um, but it is, I think, the, you know, the broader range of languages that one has, the more sort of tools one has. And uh, I've tried to bring those to bear in writing, you know, obviously these uh, these versions in Proteus Bound, but also in my own poems. Uh, so yeah, uh, the goal is the goal is breadth uh, to some extent with these, uh, as, all, as well as, you know, I would say with individual translations, one wants to be uh, as accurate as one can to the depths and nuance of, of the individual translation. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm pleased that you found uh, things to like in the book, Thomas. Let me just add too that it was kind of a poetic education uh, for me, and I think one of the one of the people who wrote a blurb on the book said something similar that it's it's almost a an, an education in lit, in literature in itself. But uh, for me, especially as someone who's not too familiar with poetry, and especially with non English uh, poets, um, many of these poets. Um, I had heard of most of them, but um, many of them I was encountering their work for the first time. So it was a delightful introduction um, to many of them. Well, that was one of the goals of of, of the books, right? That, uh, you know, I wanted to provide a kind of crash course uh, for readers who do not have the various languages, uh, just with little introductions to to poets whose names may be familiar, but whose work is not. And uh, so it's sort of a, a crash call, uh, a crash course in uh, Western poetry. Uh, that's the way it's it's designed to function. But very interestingly arranged because it's not in chronological or geographical order. It's in alphabetical order by the name of the poet. So that actually 
produces quite a different experience in reading through the book from start to finish. Yeah. You know, uh, a writer whom I admire very much called Wendell Berry uh, from Kentucky once said that uh, somebody was asking him about, you know, a, a buzzword in our time, which is relevance and, you know, you know, the relevance of contemporaries or something. And, and Wendell Berry said, well, the only poet I hope to be contemporary with is Homer. And he's obviously, it's a bit of a bon mot, right? It doesn't mean that he wished he was a quasi-mythological figure from 3,000 years ago. He means, he means that there is something that is always relevant in Homer, in right. Virgil, in Dante, in these poets. And the goal of the individual poet is to achieve this kind of lasting relevance, to tap into things that are uh, fundamental, foundational to the human person. It's a way that, you know, we could think about the equivocation on the word original, originality we often use to mean novelty. We say, well, this is original when we actually mean novel. Things that are original right. tie back to origins. And, uh, you know, right. Barry in his writing, uh, essays, fiction, poetry, is trying to tap into uh, the necessary symbiosis between human and nature uh, that is very fundamental. Uh, and is original uh, for the human species. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I think uh, the goal with me is is rarely novelty. One wants to be new. One wants not to repeat what has been done, uh, but to go beyond novelty, to go to originality, where it's something that maybe has not been done or has not been done in this particular way and touches on something that's that's fundamental. And it's what I love about so many of the poems in, in Proteus is, is that they are genuinely original. So as the listener may imagine, you'll be hearing um, some of these poems, some of these translations by Ryan in this, uh, in this episode. Uh, but we're also going to be speaking um, about some themes in, in the, uh, the work of a poet. And those themes will be uh, largely taken from uh, two essays. The first being one I mentioned that was published as a booklet by Wise Blood Books, originally appeared in Dappled Things, How to Think Like a Poet. And then also the introductory essay to the collection, Proteus Bound. And these, um, they kind of go together thematically because the first um, essay that I mentioned, it's about this idea of of uh, hospitality, this ancient value of hospitality, as the Greeks called it, xenia, and how that functions for the poet and the way that the poet thinks and works. Um, but then the second essay is, of course, all about translation. And that um, is, in a way, um, at least in certain senses, a more radical or, or a more pronounced way that Xenia can work. And so the essays do fit nicely together. Um, you could also, you could almost see the the essay on translation as, um, which is really not just about translation, but, but about poetic influence in general, because you do talk about influence within the same language at the beginning of the essay. Um, it, it's really, it's like sort of an applied uh, form of Xenia. Um, so we'll be we'll be talking about both of those and uh, reading uh, some of the some of the translations um, from this new collection, mainly um, some some classical Latin verse and then some modern French verse. Um, but yeah, can we start with can we start with the the whole concept of Xenia and uh, maybe introduce us to that that idea and how how it functions in uh, literature in particular? Sure. Sure. So Xenia is is fundamentally, as you as you say accurately, it's hospitality, especially hospitality to the stranger. Um, but it's the dynamic that allows for human beings to coexist. It allows for community. Uh, the fundamental principle of community, of any community, is that let's say that you have an apple orchard. And I have, uh, and I have cows. And you come over one day with a basket of apples. Now, if I bop you over the head and take your apples, we are not going to be able to coexist peacefully. You will come back with 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 your kinfolk, and and the apple growing kind, and make war on me, and and it will just it will not work. 
Uh, and similarly, if you come over with a basket of apples and I say, hi, Thomas, great to see you with the apples and you bop me over the head and then steal my cows, we can't coexist. So Xenia is this relationship. It characterizes this relationship between host and guest. And it's at the basis of all, as I say, of all community, of all civilization, right? The only way, when we think about how civilization begins historically, it begins first where we're, we're nomadic hunters and gatherers, and then agriculture allows us to stay put, right? We start figuring out the stars, we start figuring out tides, we can stay put, we can farm, we don't have to move around all the time. But once we're living beside each other, we now have to come up with a principle that will allow us to coexist in peace. Because again, if you're overpowering me and taking my stuff, and I'm overpowering you and taking your stuff, it's perpetual war, and civilization cannot grow. We're going to be spending all of our time fighting. So Xenia, and, and Zeus is, to a great extent, in antiquity, the god of, of Xenia, it's about the relationship between the guest and the host. Because once we agree that we get along, we can build a community, right? That word community, comunere, right? We share duties, we share gifts, right? So I'm not going to have to do everything by myself. You're not going to have to do everything by yourself. You can do what you like to do, and I can do what I like to do, and we can share gifts with each other so that you can bring me apples and apple cider, and I'll give you milk and beef, and we can coexist, and we can all have nice things, right? Um, so this idea of community in a very, very practical sense, uh, it relies on Xenia. And, and if we think about the earliest literature in the West, really it has to do a great deal with Xenia and violations thereof. So in the Iliad, right. right, when the we, we, we begin in Medias Ras, but of course the war's been going on, and the war is started by what? Well, Paris Alexandros. The theft of, the theft of Helen exactly. from... Uh, yes. Yeah, Paris Alexandros has, has stolen Helen from Menelaus, and Menelaus said, you can't do that. You're my guest, and you violated this right. host and guest relationship, and you took my wife, and I'm going to go get Agamemnon, my big brother, and every Argive I can think of, and we're now going to destroy your whole world, right? Right. Uh, and of course, near the end, I think it's in 23, we see the resolution. We see a moment of actual Xenia, right, where uh, Hermes guides Priam to Achilles' tent. Right. We start that that, that poem starts right. Uh, Mean and I ate they. Uh, wrath, uh, sing, goddess uh, of the wrath of Achilles, right? Sing, goddess, and that wrath of Achilles is assuaged after Hermes leads Priam through the Myrmidons in the night, and Achilles makes his peace, however briefly, with Priam, and the living make their peace with the dead. And we now there's there's this moment of of great Xenia, it's beautiful and powerful, and it's the end of. Uh, meaning it's the end of rage, wrath for for Achilles. We see the same thing in the Odyssey, right? When we open, we're right. in Ithaca, and we have the suitors who are guests of Telemachus. And uh, uh, ooh, I'm blanking, uh, Penelope. And instead of practicing Xenia and being respectful of their hosts. They're eating up all the food. They're using up all the supplies. They're being bad guests. And, of course, Odysseus, when he returns, is going to start punching people out and shooting them with arrows. <laughs> and he's going to restore right. order. You can't, you can't break yeah. this bond. When you break this bond, everything falls apart. So Xenia is a responsibility, a duty of the host to be kind to the guest and of the guests to be kind to the host. Uh, it's more or less the golden rule, you know, uh, do unto others. It's, it's more or less that. Obviously, yeah. this is very important in the Old and New Testaments as well. I mean, with there's many yes. many instances of people being rewarded for, for their good treatment of guests. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, notably the the angels that come to visit Abraham, and you know the 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 angels that come to visit Lot. Um, there's this idea yes. that you don't know who you might be welcoming, 
Um, and this is also true of Odysseus in his disguise, um, of course. Uh, yes. Um, and so in the well, New Testament... And, and true yeah. of Christ, right? Right. Yeah, yes. I mean, can anything good come from Bethlehem? Who's right. this Who's this redneck from, from Bethlehem? Oh, right. Uh, it's the Son of God. Right. Uh, yeah, same principle. Right. So uh, in your essay, you draw a connection between Xenia um, and and the work of the uh, the poet. You, you in your essay talk about the uh, the Xenia that the mind has to practice towards reality outside itself. With this concept of Xenia, I mean the place that I like to sort of take it in terms of in terms of poetry is, you know, first epistemological, uh, right? That I think for for most modern people. Uh, at least in America, the people that I know, uh, that there is an inherited, there's an idealism. We have in our minds an ideal of how our day should go and how we want the world to go. And anything that interferes with that, we find annoying. We find noisome. Uh, we often think about other people as impediments to the realization of our private ideal. Mm -hmm. Locus classicus would be driving in traffic, right? Right. We have, ideally, I can do this drive in 20 minutes, and then there's the traffic jam, and you're sitting there, uh, you know, if I had hair, you know, you pull out the hair. Um, the people start, the reality starts to feel like an impediment to as I say, this realization of a private ideal, we start to think that our ideal is reality, that we are the hosts, uh, we, are, we are the ones who should run the world. And so everything that gets in the way feels inconvenient, and it's very easy to be annoyed and to be angry and to feel bitter. And the way I would extend this idea of Xenia is to remember that everyone else sitting in traffic is also a human being and is dynamic and has hopes and dreams and faults and shortcomings and is wounded. We're all wounded. We're all hurt. We're all real people. We're not just impediments in each other's, uh, to, to the realization of each other's ideals and to extend this, this humanity. And it's difficult because things like cars and, and the internet, they turn us into abstractions. It's much easier to, uh, you know, yell at someone from your car while they're in a car than it is to yell at somebody face to face. And, right. Uh, and it's because we, we, we have this abstraction. We don't remember the full humanity of other people. Uh, in fact, I would say we rarely remember our own full humanity. Think, speaking of traffic, if you've ever been on 95 around where I live, there's always yep. somebody going like 100 miles an hour weaving in and they don't think they can die. Right. They don't remember they're human. They can die. Other people can die. Uh, and so Xenia, in, in, in this sense, is, is largely about remembering that other people are real right. and that we ourselves are real and we're not perfect. And our ideal world, should we be able to realize it, would be horrific. Everyone sort of has, has the suspicion, you know, of being sort of Caligula, just waiting on a scepter. If I was in control, everything would go great. <laughs> And I think, no, it would go horribly. Uh, no, one, no one's personal ideal would actually be a good world. It would be a terrible world. Right. Um, so just extending the remembrance of humanity to, to others, uh, which is a version, as I say, of this, of this fundamental principle. I'm not going to bop you. I'm not going to overpower you. I'm not going to destroy you. Uh, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to give you the dignity of, of difference. Um, and I think that allows for civility and it allows us to check this idealism within us that would, you know, this sort of will to power that wants everything to go our way. Right. Uh, and for the poet, uh, it also, it takes the form of, yes, uh, welcoming the, the reality of other human beings and their experiences into one's mind, into one's imagination and heart, um, but also just the world around us more generally, the, the, not the world of ideas, but also the world of the world of things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, my former teacher, Derek Walcott, wrote in his uh, Nobel Prize lecture called the, uh, the Lesser Antilles, he said, 
For the poet, it is always morning in the world, despite the nightmare of history. Hmm. So he's borrowing a bit from Joyce there, the nightmare yeah. of history from Ulysses. Uh, but you know, Derek grew up in St. Lucia, which was then a colony of the United Kingdom. People there had no voting rights. They had few rights. They had just been colonized by often very vicious British people. And many of the inhabitants were of African descent and had been brought there as slaves. There was a lot of reason to be bitter. Uh, and Derek was not a bitter person, not a bitter writer. Without forgetting the nightmare of history, the emphasis in that sentence and in his work is for the poet is always mourning in the world. There's all this wonder, there's all this splendor in the world, there's all this beauty. And we shouldn't forget ever about history and its complexities and its ugliness and its barbarisms and catastrophes. But we also have to remember that the world goes on and the world is beautiful and it's always bringing forth new life and there's always rejuvenation and there's always the possibility of rejuvenation and hope and and these things um so yeah you know i I think we have to remember that the world is bigger than we are you know with our preoccupations as i say we can confuse the ideal world in our mind of how we want things to go or how we think things ought to be with the real world and we can feel embittered toward the real world because it doesn't live up to our expectations but i think you know, as T.S. Eliot said in the Four Quartets, he said, the only wisdom worth acquiring is humility. Humility is endless. I think if we can acquire that humility and appreciate the wonder of the world that exists, uh, it's a healthy counterbalance, right? We need, we need both. We don't need to forget history, but we also don't need to forget the wonders of the world, the beauty of the world. People fall in love. We're alive. How about this? There's nowhere else in the galaxy where there's anything. Single blade of grass were discovered on Mars. The world would stop. Everyone would be terrified. Look out your window and you can see, depending on where you are, hundreds or thousands or millions or billions of blades of grass. And we take it for granted. Right. Right. But it's a miracle that life exists here and nowhere else to our knowledge is it is quite Quite simply, it's a miracle, and and it's important to remember right. that. So this this senior, it, it takes take in the, with the poet's life. It, it well in general, it, it takes the form of, you know, f- what you were talking about, uh, recognizing this reality and and allowing it a space in your in yourself, but also um, in the bigger picture, recognizing that you are actually the guest <laughs> in the world. As you were saying, you know, our our minds are not the measure of reality, and so our minds are not. Uh, just host to reality, even though in a sense they are greater things than the physical, than the mere, you know, sort of material things around us. Um, nonetheless, there is a there is a transcendence that we have to, and a reality that we have to accept and that we have to live within. Um, so you 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 get to this idea um, applied specifically to the work of the poet of the romantic turn and the classical the classical turn. Um, and, and the romantic turn seems to have to do with this first step of Xenia, does it not? Well, I, I think they both do uh, in, in different ways. So, I mean, maybe it would be helpful to use an example. Uh, so I think of a poem like, um, do you know Wordsworth's Westminster Bridge? mm uh, so I, I can give it to you. So uh, sure. I think I can. It's been a while. Hang on. Um, okay, so this is, uh, he writes this in 1802. It's sometimes misdated 1803. And he says, Earth has not anything to show more fair. So well, let's remember, he's on Westminster Bridge. He's going into London. He's just been writing a poem that says, The world is too much with us late and soon. Uh, getting and spending, we give our powers away, a sordid boon, right? He, he's not a fan of the city, Wordsworth. He, mm-hmm. he's, he's very much a pastoral poet, but he's, he's looking, he and his sister Dorothy are, are on this bridge going into London, and he writes this poem, and it starts, shockingly, looking at London in the early 19th century. So we have to imagine this is sort of Dickensian, 
right? It's it's dreary. There's no the sewage doesn't work. It's stinky. There's filth everywhere. And he says, Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would he be of soul, who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all that mighty heart is lying still. So Wordsworth is fairly obviously a romantic poet. He is the romantic poet. He is the great romantic poet. Uh, when I'm using romantic in classical terms, it's a little bit different, as we'll talk about. But uh, so this poem, he's he's coming into London, and it's the early morning. And it's a Saturday, as I believe, uh, that year. Uh, and so the factories are not going yet. It's the smokeless air. Everybody's still asleep. There's nobody out there. And the city seems to him suddenly beautiful. And you say, well, why is it beautiful? And there are certain lines that stand out. It says, you know, he says, uh, silent, bare ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky. Open unto the fields and to the sky? What in the world does mm, that mean? Yeah. Open unto the fields? Well, the suggestion is that the fields can now invade them. Right. They are open to invade right. it. And for Wordsworth, the fields and the sky are synonymous, right? He, he has placed uh, God in an eminent position in nature, mm -hmm. right? So, as in, uh, I wandered lonely as a cloud, right? Where the, the daffodils are described as being like stars. The heaven and the earth for Wordsworth are merged. Now, we may not agree with that vision. I'm just describing sure. what it is. So open unto the fields and to the sky. Suddenly, nature and the God who, for Wordsworth, is in nature are able to take over this city that has pushed nature out, that is destroying it with these terrible factories. Right. And why is that? It's because, as he writes in the last line, all that mighty heart is lying still. Well, if your heart's still, you're dead. He's gotten to London early in the morning, and it looks like there's been an apocalypse. <laughs> it looks like London is over, and nature is going to take it back over. And so there's this element of what, the romantics called the sublime, mm. right? Which is a translation from Kant, uh, unaus vickelbar, uh, that which cannot be unfolded. So it's a blend of wonder and beauty and fear. But as he's, as he's, as he's experiencing this, right, he dramatizes the experience in the sonnet. And my favorite moment in this, he's standing on the bridge, right? So silent bear, ships, towers, domes, and theaters, uh, ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep. So he's meditating, and it's almost like he just looks down from the bridge, and he says, the river glideth at his own sweet will. What he realizes is that despite all of the machinations and the machines of uh, then modern London, nature doesn't care. Nature, nature wins. The world outlasts us all. The world will outlast London. It outlasted ancient Rome. It outlasted ancient Athens. It outlasted every city, and it will outlast us. The river glideth at his own sweet will. Now, here, we might say, this is a very romantic poem. We have the romantic sublime. He's seeing for himself. He's having this kind of vision. But it's also, it's making what I would call the classical turn, uh, which is a turn toward the language of common men. In fact, Wordsworth says famously in his preface, the lyrical ballads, that a poem should be a man speaking to men. Uh, it sounds like speech. And I like it when he comes, he changes the registers. He says, ne'er saw I, ne'er, with the, with the contraction ne'er, mm -hmm. ne'er saw I, never felt. Right, it becomes even more sort of grounded in speech. He's not using the 
the the poetic elision anymore. Ne'er so I never felt. It's really grounded. Mm. Uh, so it's this very personal poem, very romantic in many ways. He's seeing for himself. He's having this experience. He's describing it. But he's got, you know, it's a perfectly turned Miltonic sonnet. And he has this allusion uh, to Dante there, right? I, I feel like uh, he says, you know, the river glideth at his own sweet will. And it's this moment of reckoning where for Wordsworth, you know, there is an eminent God in nature. And so it's saying God does what God wants to do. Uh, and of course, you know, for, for readers of Dante, it will recall uh, Picarda Donati's famous speech from Paradiso 3, where she tells Dante, in la sua volontà de nostre pace, in his will, and God's will is our peace. Mm. Wordsworth has this moment of peace and reckoning uh, in that w Westminster Bridge. And of course, it's significant it's a bridge. It's right. between the city and the country. It's between the present and the past. And he's moving between those visions uh, in a way that I think is characteristic of the poet. And he's trying to reconcile them. And he has this moment of peace to realize that there are mortal limits. The human being has a limit. And we are the guests of nature. We are, you know, in our minds, it often feels like we are the hosts, but the world goes on. We pass away and the river keeps gliding at its own sweet will. So when you use this phrase, the classical turn, um, does that mean um, the making the turn towards making something intelligible and thereby involving some kind of technique, some kind of craft and uh, outward form to do so? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Right. The, the, the romantic turn, uh, which varies from romantic poetry, I, I specify in that uh, in how sure. to think like a poet. Uh, romantic because this is true because this is present in all real poetry yes exactly exactly it doesn't matter the era or what we label it the romantic turn is i'm i'm calling it the romantic turn because it is characteristic of the romantic spirit to be a seeker to yeah. seek for oneself uh and taken to an extreme that idea that that if you make that a principle i'm going to seek for myself and there are no bounds suddenly you become Lucifer, you become you become Milton Satan, you become Ulysses right. in Inferno twenty six, uh, right? I mean, there there that's a very dangerous proposition to seek without bounds. Uh, mm -hmm. We see it we see it glamorized by the twenty four year old yo, you know young Tennyson in his poem Ulysses to strive to seek to find and not to yield. Great. Uh, you know, it's good to have that impulse to think for yourself to, to that, 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 uh, that self-reliance, as Emerson would call it. I think if, if there's no check on it, it becomes deleterious. Um, but nonetheless, I think that, that is a healthy impulse, right? That romantic impulse of individualism. I want to experience things for myself. I want to think for myself. I want to read for myself. I want to loaf and invite my soul and think about my own life. Right? All of that, all of that is quite consonant with with any kind of Christianity, right? As soon as as soon okay. as as soon as the resurrection makes us the heroes of our own stories, and gives the individual this great value, it makes sense that we should think about our own lives and try to make our own lives, um, you know, go on our own venture, go on our own quests as a, as a hero does. Right, we have right. to figure out who we are for right. ourselves, and hopefully, we will find our vocation that that God has given us. But we have to we have to find it. We have to search. We're all on our own journeys. Uh, but as I say, if you if you make this a principle and you say, "Well, I'm not going to listen to anyone," you know, no one can teach me anything. Then then it becomes very risky. You know, if you say there's no, there's no bounds, I will right. keep going. And I think then it becomes quite risky. Uh, so the classical turn, however, right. Uh, the romantic turn, so I don't mean going beyond and, and becoming satanic and, and all this. I mean seeking for oneself. The classical turn is, well, when you've gone and you've, and you've thought for yourself and you've felt for yourself and you've lived your own life, now you have to be able to put it in words that make sense to other people. And this is where poetry right. gets very difficult, right? Uh, we all have lived our own lives and, and have thought for ourselves and have felt things that no one else has ever felt because they've never been us in our particular time in these particular situations no one knows what any one of us knows in the exact same way no one has felt what we felt in the exact same way they're analogs but we have our private lives that are completely unique in that word's true sense one of a kind so how then do we communicate 
And this is what I call the classical turn. And this is learning about words. It's learning how to use words. It's learning how to arrange them. It's learning about syntax. It's learning about uh, form and rhythm and, and, and the, you know, the, all of the elements of, of poetry and of rhetoric as well. I mean, we would be talking about you know, schemes and rhetoric. How do we order these words to best, ooh, I split an infinitive. How do we order these words best to capture our experience to make that experience available to others, right? Uh, so on the one hand, I think, you know, a writer to have anything to say has to have this romantic spirit. You have to have thought and read and meditated and looked at the world and felt things and lived life to have anything interesting to say. But you also then have to have, you have to cultivate and discover often, but often that discovery is through study. You have to, you have to come to techniques that allow you to say, what it is that you have discovered. Now, it's not always that you're going to find the way to do it by looking at writers of the past. You know, you think about some of the modernist writers, Virginia Woolf, William Faulkner, they're not really models for what they were doing formally. And they did something that's groundbreaking. And that's sort of why they're, they're amazing and important writers. Um, nonetheless, I think for, for, for most of us, most of the time, uh, we can find models, and even if we don't use the models, we can borrow this thing here and borrow that thing there and come up with something uh, that is that is new and that is ours and is, as I say, capable of expressing as fully as possible uh, whatever wisdom uh, that we have come to in our sort of romantic journey. Um, so going back to the bridge you mentioned, um, the bridge in... Um... Wordsworth, uh, in this essay, you introduce this idea of a psychopomp, uh, somebody who guides souls between worlds, and you you use the figure of Hermes. Um, and I mentioned this because you use a different figure from mythology in the other essay, um, and it's worth talking about both. But you, this idea of guiding people between worlds, and and the poet um, who is able to make the romantic turn and the classical turn simultaneously, ultimately, as you say, a mature poet will. Um, He's going to be able to guide souls um, from uh, – I don't want to make it sound like it's just about his perception of reality, but he's going to be able to make intelligible to other people, like you were saying, what he's seen, what he's seen in reality. So it's not just about directing them into his inner experience for its own sake, but it is for the sake of – uh, a reality that they can all share in, but he he plays a unique role, um, intermediary role in that process. Yes, right. So you know, Pascal says uh, somewhere in the Pensee, all that is for the sake of the author is worthless. <laughs> that may be that may be a little too 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 strict, um, but yeah, the the goal here is not uh, simply you know, Thomas, I want you to understand me. So I've written, you know, that, that I, I think is not the, the, the goal. Um, I think it's about psychic flexibility. Uh, and poets are always trying to remind us of things that we have forgotten or that we want to forget, right? Uh, you know, the, the word in Latin for a poet is, is wates. And uh, wates means both poet and prophet. Right. And in what sense is a poet a prophet? Well, if we take prophecy in a Thomistic sense, uh, uh, also quasi-Platonic sense, of reminding us of what we have known and forgotten, right. that's very often what poets are doing, right? I mean, the vast majority, if you took the greatest lyric poems in the world, you picked a thousand. I'm going to say at least a third of them are going to have really deep thoughts like, you're going to die, or more complexly, you're going to die, so make the most of your time now. I mean, it's right. not it's not crazy complex, but it's a thing that we're always forgetting. Right. right. We were talking about the guy in traffic doing 100 miles an hour. We he's forgotten that he's going to die. He's forgotten. He's forgotten that. And a po a, a poems are often just reminding us of these very basic, very basic grounded truths that we like to forget, or that it's easy to forget, or we want to forget that we are mortal, that we are limited, that we need to 
try to make the most of the time that we have, that we should be kind to one another, that things that are beautiful are nice. You know, these, these simple, simple ideas very often. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's not about, you know, you need to know that my, you know, my second toe is longer than my big toe. No one, no one, no one cares, right? We're trying to, we're trying to, we're trying to get at some sort of, at some sort of, uh, fundamental reality. Yeah. Right. right? Um, and, and poets, you know, I think are, are pretty good at, at doing that, uh, and at guiding us, um, you know, good poets tend to be pretty good guides, even if we don't always agree with their theology or uh you know their world views that a good a good poem very often whatever we think about the individual uh can take us somewhere can can make us feel viscerally make us feel vividly uh these these fundamental truths that we're always forgetting because we live in our heads that is they can ground us in our bodies again can ground us in a specific time and place which it's hard to be grounded in a specific time and place uh, now, right? We've all got, you know, if you go to a restaurant, you got TVs on the wall, you got a stereo going, you got everybody's making noise, everybody's looking at a phone. We're in five places at once. Mm -hmm. And we forget that for all, of, that's all an illusion. It doesn't matter all of our technology. We're actually just one person in one place at one time. And eventually our time will run out. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that sort of movement uh, of the poet is often towards something very simple, uh, like a limitation, realizing the limitation of uh, the human or realizing the beauty of nature or realizing, uh, you know, one's mortality, these, these simple things. But those are things that we're always forgetting. We're very forgetful as, as human beings. Before we move on to translation, um, would you like to read uh, your poem, your original poem from The Stranger World uh, on the topic of Xenia? Oh, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. And uh, I have given away all of the copies of that book, uh, so I could not prepare. Normally, I would just recite it, uh, but I am actually going to read it. Uh, well, I think I will recite most of it, but uh, let's see. All right, so Xenia. One day, a silent man arrives at your door in an outdated suit, threadbare and black, like a lost mourner or a Bible salesman who's been robbed. Penniless, he needs a place to stay. And you, magnanimous you, soon find this stranger reading in your chair, eating your cereal, drinking your tea, or standing in your clothes at the window, awash in afternoon's alien light. You tire of his constant company. Your floorboards creak with his shuffling footfalls, haunting dark rooms deep in the night. You lie awake in blackness, listening, cursing the charity or pride that opened up the door for him and wonder how to explain yourself. He smells like durian and smoke, but it's mostly his presence, irksome, fogging the mind up like breath on a mirror. You practice cruelty in a mirror, then practice sympathetic faces, you ghoul. Your cunning can't deceive you. You're afraid to call your friends for help, knowing what they would say. It's just you two. You throw a fit when he sneaks water into the whiskey bottle. Then make amends. You have no choice except to learn humility. To love this stranger as yourself who won't love you or ever leave. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot to say about that because as I said, I'm not, I'm not a, a very good interpreter of poetry, but um, I, uh, I'm definitely curious if this stranger is meant to be 
um, a sort of uh, a sort of doppelganger or a sort of uh, aspect of this the, uh, the 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 person being addressed in the poem uh, aspect of that person, or if it actually is literally, you know, another person. Well, it sounds like you're a very good interpreter, Thomas. <laughs> that 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 question is that that question tells me that you have interpreted very well. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. Uh, but you know, I would I would one of the one of the things that I learned years after the book came out uh, is you know one. It, it is very difficult to write something that is completely other than anything that has ever been written, right? Uh, that is very different. Uh, so I was saying that poem, and, uh, you know, this is maybe just a couple of years ago, years after the book came out, and somebody said, oh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like Bartleby the Scrivener. Mm. You know, uh, Melville's, Melville's great story. With, totally. Uh, I just read that for the, the first time the, pretty recently. Yeah, the man who would prefer not to do anything. And uh, and I thought, oh goodness, you're right. It is sort of Bartleby the Scrivener. And I, you know, I love that story, but I certainly didn't have it in mind when I wrote it. it but it's it's you know, in the in that story in Bartleby, right? You remember our narrator. So that is a that is a story of Wall Street. Uh, that's the subtitle, quite uh right explicitly and uh this is in the days when john jacob astor is wall street is becoming wall street right astor right. is making millions and millions uh when people were making you know a hundred dollars a year he's making millions uh but the 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 lawyer the unnamed lawyer who's the narrator at some point he says uh he says about bartleby and i, I don't have it i should um i don't have the words exactly but he says uh you know at a certain Right, we we all feel for for those who are sort of downtrodden. We want to, we want to help, but Bartleby, you know, he keeps trying to help him. He's like, you know, do you want to come home with me? Can I send you to relatives? Can I give you money? And Bartleby would prefer not to. And, and the narrator says, you know, at a certain point, when you realize that you can't help, the 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 empathy runs out, and you start to feel bitter. Totally. Uh, totally. And 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 I think you know, there's something very profound in that, but it's also about Xenia, right? And the and the guest host relationship. You remember Bartleby is living in the narrator's law offices. Uh, the narrator, therefore, is a host, and Bartleby is a guest. And here's a guest that you can't help. And you can't get him to do what you want to do, and you can't get him away from you. There's just this imperfection that you have to live with. Uh, and I think that's sort of what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about the ideal. Uh, vision that we have and seeing others as an impediment right. to that ideal. Right. That there's just this intractable, imperfect reality that is living in our office and we can't get rid of it. And we can get bitter about it. We can, you know, have him arrested as the narrator does with Bartleby and, you know, he dies in jail. We, but there's, there's a, a responsibility, I would say, for, for Catholics to practice caritas and to love this imperfectness to love this to, to not to not to not to settle right not to forget that it's imperfect but to mm -hmm. forgive the imperfection while striving to make it better right? right you keep trying to help even if even if it's futile you keep trying to help but you love you also just have to love you have to you have right. to forgive and you have to love uh because if you approach anything if you approach the world differently i think it just lends itself to to bitterness and and being aggrieved all the time and angry all the time and um, yeah it's a it's a I, I think a, a deleterious way to be in the world I think I think that forgiveness which requires a great deal of humility and courage um, if those are different things it seems to me a way out of this cycle of just resentment and anger and, and, and unhappiness. So now we're going to get to the topic of translation. And uh, maybe the best way to start with that is just to, to talk about the title of your collected translations, Proteus Bound. What does that signify? Yeah, so uh, Proteus uh, was a, a sea god in antiquity, and um, he was a, a shapeshifter. Um, he is described in... Uh, the fourth book of Virgil's Georgics as uh, the sea god who lives in a cave and he's sort of in command of seals and fishes and everything. And uh, 
if a human encounters him and tries to uh, ask questions of him, if you pin him down, he will turn into a tiger or a dragon or fire or anything else. Um, so he's constantly shape-shifting. Uh, but if you pin him down, he will tell the truth. And the truth that he tells in the Georgics is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus, the great singer, poet, uh, whose beloved Eurydice is bitten by a snake and so dies and goes down into Hades, the realm of the dead. Orpheus is very distraught. Uh, he travels down as Hermes. The, he's called a psychopomp. He's the guide of souls, as we mentioned earlier. Psychopomp is guide of souls. Uh, because he leads the dead souls down into Hades. We see this in book 24 of the Odyssey, for instance. Uh, he's the only god who can move between the three discrete realms. Right, He can move between the realm of the gods on Mount Olympus, he can move into the realm of humans, and he can go into the realm of the dead. He's the only one who has that ability. So Orpheus, very much in the manner of Hermes Mercury, the psychopomp, goes down into the realm of the dead, and he strikes a bargain with the god Hades, the god of the dead, uh, sometimes called Dis, uh, or Pluto, meaning meaning wealth. Uh, wealth came out of the ground, right? Uh, gold, silver came out of the ground. So he goes down there, and he sings so beautifully. He charms Cerberus, the three-headed dog, and all the ghosts come around to listen. He sings so beautifully, and they say, well, you sing so beautifully, you can, you can take Eurydice back to the realm of the living. And there's one condition, which is that you can't look back until you get above ground. And right. So uh, Orpheus leads her out, and of course he's so um, sort of euxorious. Uh, he's, so, he's so concerned for her uh, as they're walking back up toward the realm of the light that just on the verge of the light, he looks back to make sure she's okay. And uh, of course then she's immediately stolen. So Orpheus has, has long been a figure for the poet. The poet goes down into memory. Uh, it is a kind of catabasis or a descent into the realm of the dead. Uh, my friend Ernie Hilbert has a fine poem where he writes that memory is, is it memory is nothing but a bunch of ghosts, something like that, uh, that entering this, this realm of the past is what the poet always does. And the poet tries to sing beautifully enough to give the past, the memory, some life. And a good poet gets pretty near that. You can take an experience and more or less bring it to life where other people can experience it and share in it, but you can't quite ever do it. It's never quite the real thing. Uh, that is, poets don't raise the dead. We are not right. Jesus. Uh, he's, he's, he's sort of the, the one who does that. Uh, we, we don't get to do that. We get close, uh, right? There's, there's a, in a sense, right? In a figural sense, not a, not a literal sense, in a figural sense. And, uh, anyway, so that's the story that, that Proteus tells is about this poet and how his beautiful song almost is able to bring the dead back to life. And I think that is what every poem is saying. Every poem is saying some aspect, whether it's personal or not. It doesn't have to be, you know, factually true, autobiographically. It can be a feeling, whatever. It's something a poet has felt or thought or experienced or seen. You're trying to bring back to life with a song. And the song uh, is, you know, at its best, a kind of enchantment that creates the illusion of that thing being alive again, being among the living again even though it escapes the grasp, as Eurydice does poignantly in, in Virgil. He reaches out three times, and she escapes his grasp, like smoke mingling in the air. You can't hold smoke. and uh, So there's always this failure to, to poems, and there's always a failure to translation 
as well. Anyway, so I, so I, I, I like the figure of Proteus uh, as a figure for the translator, because obviously in this book where I'm translating poems from seven languages across almost 3,000 years, I'm taking on a lot of different shapes, right? It's a kind of shape shifting. Uh, you know, in one poem, I'm Homer. In the next poem, or, or in the, you know, right before I'm Homer, I think I'm George Heim, mm -hmm. who lived in the fantasy acla of the uh, 19th, 20th century in Germany. Well, you move straight from Francis of Assisi to Baudelaire. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so exactly. And, and uh, yeah, so this moving across time, moving across personalities, um, you know, and there's a, there's an idea in, in Aquinas that, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the human, uh, spirit is capable of becoming in a sense, all things. I was just about to bring that up. Yeah. That yeah. Um, kind of knowledge given by Aristotle and St. Thomas. That's right. Uh, so in that sense, right. And, and what I would do is disambiguate. So so what happens after uh, you know in in the in the Renaissance, as as the schoolmen are pushed out of favor for say, the Baconian Neandros or New Man, the New Man was going to use reason to explain the entire world, right? Uh, and scientifically, it was it was working quite well. But when the intellect is reduced to the ratio to reason, we lose. Right so much of what's human. And this is what Kant is on about with the critique of pure reason, right? Where the focus is on what is intuitive, what's emotional, the ways of understanding that are not pure reason, right? right. Uh, and so if we go back to the schoolmen, if we go back to Thomas, right, we would talk about the ratio in the intellectus, right? The intellectus is a speculative faculty. Uh, and that is in, that is that speculative faculty is what enables us to become, in a sense, all things. Speculative from the 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 Latin for mirror speculum, right? Right. We see we Knowledge see like naturality. Yes, we see likeness in others. We see likeness in the world around us, and we're able to understand it in that way. So, the imagination is a is a speculative faculty. It's it's. It's telos is knowledge. It, it's not power. It's not practical, right? It is not a practical thing. It is purely intellectual. And the goal is to mirror, right? To serve as a mirror and to see what we might call with uh, Baudelaire and Emerson and some of the romantics, uh, if we're not terrified to, to, to go there, uh, we could go into Swedenborg's theory of correspondences as a way of just finding likeness, right? We don't have to buy Swedenborgianism whole, but a way of finding a likeness between mm -hmm. creatures, between myself and a milkweed, myself and a stone, myself and a jaguar, right? And so poets are always doing that. And there are great poems that take on the persona of a milkweed and a stone and a jaguar. Uh, because this speculative faculty finds these correspondences. And so the goal there is just, it's just understanding. It's just a way of sort of shape-shifting to understand parts of ourselves through the world around us. Um, and translation is very much like that, right? That I don't agree oh. with, with Sappho or Horace or George Heim about everything, but you can enter into a different space and discover parts of yourself while you're discovering other people. And how important is the work of translation to uh, improving yourself as an original poet? Yeah, you know, I, I think it depends on who you are as a poet. There, there's not one way to be a poet. There are as many ways to be a poet as there are good poets. And I don't even know that I'm a good poet. Uh, but for me, and for many, 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 many of uh, the great poets, uh, translation is, is extraordinarily important. What I tell young people who want to be poets is to practice translation of great poets and to practice imitation of great poets. So if you're a native English speaker, you can't translate Milton. Well, that's not true. You can tra translate Milton from Greek and Latin 
in the poems he wrote in Greek and Latin. But if you're if you're wanting to write in the Miltonic style, you can do an imitation, and it's a sort of similar thing. And I would say, you know, for me, that was extraordinarily important um, to learn about the possibilities of language, to learn about the possibilities of form, to learn about, uh, especially with something like, you know, French or or Latin or Greek, the figura etymologica, where you can form mm -hmm. patterns based on etymons uh, that are sort of subterranean patterns. So you have the illusion of colloquial speech, but there are these subterranean patterns based on etymologies. Um, so that the reading, so that the reader is pleased on first encountering and can understand it, but can continue to go back into the poem and discover these patterns so that the poem gets richer uh, the more that they understand languages. That's something that Shakespeare certainly does. He's always using the figura etymologica. Um, so yeah, I, I think with translation, you know, it's, it's invaluable. Uh, it's invaluable because it helps you to understand um, the history of ideas to whatever degree. Uh, it helps you to understand how different languages are capable of different things and possibilities within your own language. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it just, I, I could go on and on about, about what all it teaches. And, and the great thing about it is that you don't necessarily have to be inspired. The best translations will come like the best poems when you're inspired, when, when, there's something a little eldritch happening, but you can sit down any old day and work on a translation uh, in the way that, you know, I think as a lyric poet, you're not often able to do. You know, novelists are very good about this. Graham Greene, you get up, you write your 500 words, then you go be crazy Graham Greene the rest of the day and you're fine, right? You're Hemingway, you get up at 6 a.m., you write your 500 words, then you go do Hemingway craziness. With poets, it's it's harder to get up every day and and just write a poem uh, because we're not feeling I'm not feeling inspired every day. But you can always translate. And so it's a way of keeping your 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 toolkit sharp of picking up new tools, new forms, new images. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's an invaluable tool. and not that everybody has to do it, but I encourage it uh, wherever possible. How many different languages are represented in this book? Uh, seven, not counting dialects. Okay. So uh, one question I had for you was about uh, specifically studying different languages and poetry in different languages and how that, I mean, like qua the language, how, how does that contribute to your English poetry in different ways? Like how would learning uh, this or that particular language influence you as a as a poet in English abstracted from the subject matter or the individual poet yeah uh, you know a lot of it is uh, as I say about learning word roots uh, you know mm. the etymons of, of words uh, when one can use a word uh, with acuity uh, one is capable of arresting phrasing so that word acuity is an example right acuity from acuere to make sharp so in the first poem of my book the stranger world it's about a little boy who's sword fighting with his with his shadow at his birthday party uh right. it's also about the communal murder of the human spirit and demand of conformity uh but there's a <laughs> There's a subterranean pattern. To I was actually just looking at that. I actually literally, I just photographed that poem and sent it to a friend of mine earlier today, actually. Right. Yeah. So, so that, in, the, in the last stanza of, of that poem, there's the, the word manly acumen, right? And acumen is right. from acuary. And so it ties into this pattern of sharpness and blades and, and uh, really what Rene Girard would call it scapegoating. Um, so you can you can work in these sort of subtleties, and they're, it's sort of a you know I think a, a lot of people call them Easter eggs, um, but it also it helps you to know what words actually mean and to understand how words are being used by other writers who know their language as well. We have to remember that until the twentieth century, every every English language poet, with the exception of maybe Keats, had you know pretty formidable Latin and and some Greek. 
And they're using words in ways that are simultaneously colloquial and activating the etymon to form a subterranean pattern. And mm. to abandon that entirely is to lose the depth of, of, of your poem. So part of it is it right. helps you to create these depths, but it also just helps to create arresting phrases. Uh, manly acumen, you know. What, what about the way that, um, you know, different languages um, lend themselves to different types of poetic form, different different ways of working in poetry. So, um, you know, the the, the way that um, sort of modern, and I don't mean like 20th century, but modern more broadly English poetry works is is kind of similar in some ways to the way that German poetry works compared to classical Latin poetry. Um, and I'm not, I don't want to oversimplify it, but but um, how would uh, studying a poetry in a language where p the poetry just works totally differently inform your English poetry. Right. I mean, well, the the example would be Greek or Latin. They work entirely differently because they're inflected languages, and the syntax is is radically different. We we have a very right. Germanic subject verb object structure in in almost all of our sentences, and that's right. That's not in that's not in Greek and Latin, and so it, it's about pliancy of, of syntax. And to get away from a subject verb object structure in English is tricky because it has to sound like spoken English to some extent. It has to have the illusion of being spoken English. But right. there's a way, there's a way that we can do this with, with fragmentation with hyperbaton, especially using sort of dashes or parentheses. Uh, there, there are all sorts of ways that we talk that is not at all the way that you learn to write in English 101, but you can capture some of that in a poem, right? If, if you're cognizant of making it meaningful, where it's not just, well, this sounds sort of like talking, but you're using that syntactical arrangement meaningfully in the way that Languages like Greek and Latin use their syntax meaningfully. They put words next to each other for a reason. So I'll give you an example. In Horace's Ode 1 5, Quis multa gracilis te puer in rosa perfusus liquidis urgeto doribus grato pira subantro. So the question is which uh, gracilis, which grassle, which handsome, which felt puer boy? Uh, Urget pushes up against you down in your cave, Pira. So Horace is talking to someone he's got a crush on, <laughs> who is uh, yeah. holed up in her cave with a with a handsome young guy. So in the in the syntax of that of that first line, right? So if we if we if we said, you know, in an English, just a straightforward English subject verb object, it would be which handsome young man grinds against you, Pira, something like that, right? But the way that it's structured in Latin, quis, which, multa gracilis, uh, very graceful, puer, te, boy, you. The boy and the you and the lion are right next to each other. Because, hmm. of course, in the cave, they're right next to each other. Right, the verb doesn't come uh, until way later in line two. Cool. Right, so that's it's cool. quis multa gracilis tapeware in rosa. So on roses, on this bed of roses, before we get to the verb, we have the you and the boy right next to each other. Right, right, right. So that's a happy, that's a happy way of using that syntax when you don't have to have subject verb object. You can move things around. So it can challenge you, can you to embody. stretch your English. It can challenge you to stretch your English. Exactly. Exactly. So you can think of ways to create this sort of phenomenon where a line syntactically is embodying what it's describing. Uh, now, this doesn't mean you can't, you can't do what Horace did. You can't move the verb later like that, but you can come up with ingenious ways to do things like have the boy and the you next to each other. I'll give you an example, right? So in the 16th and 17th century, as we're anglicizing uh, ceremonies, uh, we see 
a desire to imitate this effect in Latin. So you finish this line for me. With this ring, I... The wed. Yeah. Why are I and thee next to each other? Why isn't mm. I wed thee? Right. It's the exact, right. It's the exact same thing. The wed right. is to join together wow. the I and the the as Horace did with the te and the puer, right? That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So it's it's that kind of thing. And of course, you can't say I thee wed in a, in a contemporary poem, but you, you get ideas about how syntax can be manipulated to create a version of arrangement that is not just linear, where it's not just the words in a row mean this thing. There's also a vertical element to the arrangement of the words. That's amazing. Now, is there any danger of um, adulteration here, like of, of becoming less English and and sort of losing that uh, you know virile Anglo-Saxon uh, language that Tolkien was so resentful about the the Norman <laughs> conquest, you know, because well, of well, and, and all the English. I mean, it's it's why there's still the animosity on behalf of the English against the French. They just don't like that mm -hmm. French was the official language of England for three hundred years. Um, yeah. Obviously, and uh, you know, translators call it translatees, where you mm. where you try to imitate the effects of the original to the point where it doesn't sound like English anymore, um, oh. and that's that's really a problem, and uh, it's especially a problem when you're translating a language uh, that is similar to English. Like you know, if you're doing Old English, it's very hard to bring that into contemporary English because so many of our words come out of Latin and French and that, and that romance tradition. So you're stuck with a bunch of monosyllables, but <laughs> you don't want to use all monosyllables because it doesn't sound like poetry, right? In the same way, if you're translating from Latin where everything is polysyllabic, you don't want to use all polysyllables because that doesn't sound like English. It has to be this hybrid that I was talking about earlier. You have to find a kind of happy balance. Um, and so, you know, it's, it is imperfect. Uh, you know, there's the old joke that in Latin, the verb for translate, traducere, is the same verb as to commit treason. Um, because you, you're always committing treason, either to the original or to your language uh, that you're translating into. You're going to lose. You're going to lose something. But it is, I think, uh, a tremendously helpful heuristic to take on these problems and think about how to say things, uh, as as Frost said, all the funds and how all the funds and how you say a thing, right? Uh, and again, you know, as I was saying earlier, many of the ideas in poems are quite banal. You're going to die. Right. Make the most of it. Nature is pretty, but it's the fun is in how you say it, right? And when you, the more languages you read, the more great poets you read in different languages, the more you see a variety of ways of saying things, a variety of ways of patterning poems, a variety of ways of structuring them, beginning, middle, and end, to say nothing of the the actual forms. Yep. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I've I've been just reading these early um, modern English poets like um, Wyatt and uh, Ben Johnson, and, and it has struck me how uh, often how simple the ideas being conveyed are. Uh, yeah. Um, it's been a while since, since we read anything. Uh, do you want to go? We've been talking about Latin. Uh, should we go ahead and go to Horace now? Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so with, with, with Horace, right? I mean, one of the, the things that's uh, striking uh, about him is that he's the, the poet laureate of the Aetas Aurea, the golden age of Rome. That is of Augustan Rome, the pinnacle of, of Roman civilization, uh, the era of the Pax Romana, right? So we could say that not, not everything was perfect in Rome or the provinces during this time, but the Pax Romana was a pretty good thing uh, that Augustus accomplished. So, so Horace was the poet laureate, and that's significant because he's a contemporary with Virgil. And everybody yeah. reads, you know, probably in, in high school, the, the, the Aeneid still. Uh, probably fewer people read Horace unless you're studying Latin, but he was in fact the poet laureate. They were both uh, in a coterie of poets who were supported by uh, Augustus Caesar's right-hand man, Mycenas. Mm. Uh, many, many of Horace's poems are dedicated to Mycenas. Uh, and, 
it's also striking the upward mobility that he found. So he was born not in abject poverty, but he was the son of a freed man. So his, his father had been a slave and was freed mm -hmm. and sacrificed a great deal so that Horace would be educated. Uh, and that would mean, you know, rhetoric, philosophy, these sorts of things. And Horace was uh, in Greece, as I recall, um, studying at the time of the, the great civil war right with with octavian and uh brutus and mark anthony and and horace made the very poor choice of siding with brutus uh and fought in brutus's army and was at the decisive route at uh philippi where he says that he abandoned his shield which would be a tremendously shameful thing for an ancient warrior to do it's doubtful whether or not that happened because there's a similar poem by Alcaeus, uh, the 6th century BC contemporary of Sappho, in which he talks about losing his shield, and Alcaeus hmm. is very much an influence on Horace. So we don't know if it's if he's just sort of imitating, uh, you know, a poet who was, uh, you know, several centuries older or whom he admired, or if he actually left his shield and fled. In any case, somehow he ends up in the good graces of Augustus. Right. Uh, who, you know, against whom he had been fighting. Uh, so this is, I mean, it's quite striking. And uh, Mycenas buys him a, a, a beautiful villa uh, in, the, in the countryside uh, in Tuscany. And he becomes, he's really the great chronicler of what the spirit of that age was. We see in Horace elements of Stoicism. We see elements of um, so I want to use this word properly. So, uh, do you know Lucretius, the Nereum, I know of Natura, Lucretius. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the nature of things. Atomism. Uh, so, so, uh, right. And Epicureanism. Now that's right. the word I want to use particularly because when you say Epicurean to contemporaries, they think it's like just boozing and, <laughs> And that was not it at all. The idea of Epicureanism was to live a good life. And a good life meant following Aristotle to be virtuous, right? Now, you, you might imbibe some wine, but you wanted to have moderation. Horace is the champion and the coiner of the Orea Mediocritas, the golden mean. Uh, so the idea was to live a good life. So we see Epicureanism, we see Stoicism, uh, we see a love of the pastoral, uh, and we see also in his satires, uh, the sort of follies that people were wont to fall into at the time. Um, so he's a great chronicler of the spirit of the age. We have from historians something of the kind of material reality. Sorry, I'm going to be cattywumpus because I have to plug in this computer. Oh, okay. Uh, we have from the historian something of the, the, the material aspect, but, but Horace gives us the spirit more nearly than any other point of the, of the time. Um, so, yeah, that is a sort of introduction uh, to, to who Horace was. And as I recall, you wanted to, to look at uh, the famous uh, Ode 111. Is that right? Yeah, we had a few, and, and uh, a lot of them deal with this very, very common ancient theme of death and, you know, uh, sort of count no man happy until he is dead. That's that sort of thing. Um, uh, and so the, the the first three had listed a couple uh, four that we might look at, and and three of those four deal with that. Um, uh, but yeah, we can start with one eleven. Yeah, and, and uh, if you'd like to read uh, any of these in Latin, uh, that would be great. Uh, so yeah, any, this is any the, that you see this fit. is the this is the shortest of them. So I will do this in uh in latin uh so it's eight lines these are 16 syllable lines uh and the characteristic of the meter this thing to to think about with the meter is that um the dominant foot is the coriambus which is long short short long um so there are three choriams in a row in the middle of every line. There are two syllables before, two after. So it's two syllables, choriam, 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 two syllables in each line. 
so Horace is a proponent of balance that's characteristic of him. So he only uses this meter three times. It's this poem, I believe it's Ode 118 and maybe Ode 4-8. Uh, and in each case, uh, so in this, it's 16 syllables per line, eight lines in the poem. In uh, 118, it's uh, 16 syllables per line, 16 lines in the poem. In 48, it's 16 syllables a line, eight lines in a poem. So there's this kind of mathematical balance uh, and shapeliness to them. Now, one of the things that's tricky with uh, classical Latin meter is that in English meter, we we replace a long syllable with emphasis or stress. And in a Latin meter, stress or emphasis has nothing to do with short or long. That has mm -hmm. to do with the, the vowel qualities. Uh, so it can be a little tricky. But here's, here's Ode 111. Tu ne quae siris, scire nefas, quim mihi, quim tibi finim didederint, luconui, nec Babylonius temptaris numerus. Ut melius quicquid erit, pati, seu plurius hiemis, seu tribuit Jupiter ultimam, quae nunc opositis debilitat pumicibus moro terrenum. Sapiens, vena liquis, et spatio brevis pim langam resicis. Dum loquimor, fugerit in vidaitas, carpeliem, quam minimum credula postero. So that coriambus that I mentioned, long, short, short, long, carpe diem is a perfect coriambus. Right mm -hmm. now, we're, we don't hear it because we're used to the stress. We say DM, right? But stress and the long have nothing to do with it. So it's a perfect yeah. choriam, which is one of the reasons why it's meaningful. Um, in any case, uh, I would mention that, that carpe diem, when, when one is translating that ode, one runs into a difficulty. Everybody knows carpe diem means seize the day, except it doesn't mean seize the day. Uh, carpe uh, in, in Latin is not seize at all. Uh, carpe is, well, we have the root carpals, metacarpals in our fingers, right? And the, and the figure here is that spem or hope is like grapevines. Now, if we're plucking a grape, if you seize a grape, <laughs> you have crushed the grape. So <laughs> right. seize, seize is a poor translation. It's more at pluck, pluck the grape. But pluck the grape doesn't sound as good in English. You could also say harvest. Pluck the day. You yeah. could say harvest, yeah, harvest, pluck the day. You could say harvest the day. And that actually is a choriam in terms of stress. Harvest the day, stressed, unstressed, unstressed, stress, right? That would be our approximation of it. Uh, but if you mm. write harvest the day in your translation, then your readers are not going to know that this is, this poem, this ode from Horace, is the origin of the famous phrase carpe diem. So you're sort of obliged to lose, as I said, you're going to lose something. So if you write seize the day, they'll say, oh, this is where it's from. But you've also sort of missed the, the figure. Uh, so here's, here's my translation, which I would note is one of the few, this meter is so rare in Horace. As I say, it's only used three times. And uh, normally my translations are line for line. So if there are eight lines in Horace, there's eight lines in, in Wilson's version. But a 16 syllable line in English would be an octometer, which just doesn't sound like a line at all. Right. Uh, so I broke from using line for line and uh, here wrote a sonnet in heroic couplets. There are 128 syllables in Horace's poem. There are 138 with mine because I lopped two off with acephalic lines. <laughs> so it ends up being about syllable for syllable, even though I've added six lines. Uh, hmm. So here's my version of, of Ode 111. You shouldn't ask to know as devilry what end the gods have given you and me, Lukonoi. Nor should you fix your hopes on anything you find in horoscopes. Better, whatever comes, the suffering. Whether Jupiter is judged, he'll bring us future winters, or that this shall be our last, which now whips the Etruscan sea crashing against the cliffs. 
be circumspect. Purify the wine, and if you detect vines overreaching their allotted spaces, trim them. Even as we talk, time races by begrudgingly. Seize the day, and trust tomorrow little as you may. Now, I don't have much Latin, um, but in when you were reading the Latin, did I catch, uh, did he say Babylonian numbers? Yes. Which you translated as horoscope. So that's part of what the translator has to do, not just translate the words, but also things that people won't maybe understand as, as readily. That's right. Uh, Babo Babylonian you... numbers are the tables used in astrology for right. horoscopes. Um, right. But as a translator, first you're going to be hamstrung by the word numbers if you try to rhyme it. You're going to have encumbers, slumbers, cucumbers. <laughs> right, right. And you're sort of out of it. And, and none of those show up in, in, in this. Uh, you could do something with encumber. And ba but anyway, if you, if you put Babylonian number, people are like, well, what is that? And of course, right. in Horace's time, they understood that Babylonios numeros were astrology charts basically right so yeah i i you you have to update that uh or you don't have to i i did here for the sake of being uh or or practicing xenia toward my readers to make to be a good host <laughs> right. for my readers so that it's a pleasurable thing that's the goal i mean for 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 Harris, pleasure is is primary uh, hmm. so yeah you want you want you want your odes to be pleasurable you don't want them to be tedious it's interesting um where he starts with this idea of not trying to know the future. Um, but then uh, as a consequence of that, embracing the suffering or accept, or at least accepting the suffering yes. of the present time and part of the suffering, because he doesn't actually specify um, too much what the suffering is other than the uncertainty itself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah, no, that's it. And, and, it, and, and it brings up, perfectly the distinction between the classical mind and the romantic mind. We talked about the romantic mind as being a perpetual seeker, right? And, you know, so I mentioned Ulysses, whom Dante puts in the Inferno, because he's perpetually seeking. He had no reverence. Uh, he had no sophrosyne, no circumspection. He wanted to exalt himself with this perpetual seeking. Well, the romantics love that. Right. Uh, we have in Tennyson's Ulysses, as I say, a sort of locus classicus of that to strive to seek to find and not to yield. We see a, almost a translation out of Dante in Stéphane Mallarmé's poem Brice Marine. Uh, the speaker there sounds just like Ulysses in the Inferno, except where he's talking French. Nothing's going to hold him back. Not even his, his, his pregnant wife. Nothing will hold him back. He's going to go on this journey into nature, a la somebody like Gauguin. Um, so there's this constant seeking for the romantic spirit. The classical spirit said, well, we don't know. And just sort of make yourself okay with not knowing, right? Uh, uh, that circumspection, uh, was, was, was paramount. Sophrosyne, know your limits. Don't transgress. Anybody that tries to transgress on the hidden knowledge normally gets zapped with a thunderbolt. Uh, one thing that I really liked in this poem, and I have no idea if it was intentional or not, and I normally don't even pay close enough attention to notice these things, but in the line, crashing against the cliffs, well, he, I'll, I'll begin the sentence, uh, the, the Etruscan sea crashing against the cliffs, be circumspect. And you've got that hard sea alliteration, and then circumspect, you've got this, it transitions from crashing against the cliff to this soft C and S sound. I don't know if that was, was that intentional at all? Well, yeah, uh, you know, as, as, as Pope says uh, famously um, in the essay on criticism, true ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest to have learned to dance. Does not enough, mm. no harshness give offense, the sound must seem an echo to the sense. So certainly in that line, the hard seas, I'm trying to get a something at a crashing sound, something at cacophony. Uh, right. Right. Uh, and also with the short vowel sounds. The ah, uh, eh, uh, eh, right? Those yeah. are, it's not terribly euphonious. I'm trying to make it sound unpleasant uh, to right. embody embody the sense. Uh, and then circumspect, well, that goes back to what I was saying. I mean, it's sort of the spirit of Horace is, is circumspection. Right. Uh, and it's much more 
gentle, right? Once that period right. ends, we we modulate into a bit of gentle advice. And so it needs to sound avuncular and calm, not violent in the way that the Etruscan Sea crashing against the cliff sounds. Now, purifying the wine, um, yeah. I don't know much about what this actually would have entailed. Yeah. In ancient Rome, what what is that actually? What 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 would they actually be doing there? Well, so you you you've got your grapes, you have trod on the grapes. Now you have a bunch of wine or potential wine after it ferments, but there's also a bunch of grape skins. You don't want a mm. bunch of grape skins in your wine, so you purify it. You would strain it. It would basically be a a version of a colander, right? I see. Uh, and the idea here, right? If our days are like grapes. Uh, as as they are in the in in the figure, our days are like grapes. What we want to do is to refine them, purify them, get right. rid of the dross, get rid of the 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 ugliness and the nastiness, and just have a pure, lovely wine. Make our days enchanting. That's the idea. Now, so when it's, not, says, it's not YOLO, uh, right? It's not it, the way the young people, I don't know if they, 10 years ago, they said YOLO, you know, which is a sort of yeah. seizing of the day, this violent, you know, let's just go be crazy. Right. It's not, it's not that at all for hearts. It's let's purify, let's make this lovely. Let's make our days beautiful. But, but when he says, if you detect vines overreaching their allotted spaces, trim them, is that, is that an Epicurean thing of we're going to have the most uh, refined uh, pleasure in our in these days or is he is he at all looking forward he says trust tomorrow a little as you may but is he at all looking forward to um is is there anything of virtue there is he looking forward to uh, a next life or is it more stoic um uh and he's not thinking about that at all well so so i i you know i go uh, with a literal term here where where horace uses an abstraction he, he dives right into the figure his word is spam which is just hope hopes mm -hmm. are overreaching their allotted spaces but i wanted to keep the figure and, and 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 i think that readers can sort of intuit based on well if a vine's overreaching what would that be when anything's getting out of bounds when anything is getting out of control get control of it right so it's it's about self-possession and not being carried away. Um, so it's really Epicureanism in the in the classical sense of it, which is enjoy your life, but don't get carried away, don't lose your mind, don't don't destroy yourself. But is there any sense of preparing for a good to make a good death, yeah. or is it really just about enjoying the days yeah. in the best, in the most seemly way? Yeah, there, there's there, there's not in, in in this poem any any, any sense of, of making a good death. I, I think for Horace, you know, a, a happy death would be to you know conk out while he's talking with Mycenaeus and Virgil over some wine, you know. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there, that 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 element of spirituality is. Uh, is not there in in Horace, even in the way that it is in Virgil. He sort of has a mock conversion uh, in in one of the odes, but but it's not serious. He really he he wanted to have the virtue of kairos or timeliness to be present here now. Um, mm. It's a very dangerous thing when we start thinking about the future too much. Foresight can be quite dangerous. In fact, in Greek, foresight is Prometheus, right? That's what Prometheus right, means, right. For, forethought, really, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's dangerous. You're playing with fire when you start thinking about tomorrow. Instead of, uh, as they say in the Psalms, uh, age quod agis, do what you're doing. We are liter age, et confortetor cortum, et expecto domine. Do what you're doing. Make strong your heart and wait on the Lord. Um, you know, that's what that's what David uh, encourages. And right, of course, you know there are limits uh, to 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 everything. We do need to have some thought, obviously, for eternity. But when that becomes your primary concern, I think you can forget to live here. And um, and Horace, Horace wants us to live here very much. Um. What sense are we to take this, the genre of an ode? How, how specific of a term is that? Yeah, so there, there, uh, there are a few types of odes. Um, the, the two dominant uh, types of odes 
would be the Pindaric uh, from the, uh, I want to say, fifth century uh, Greek uh, poet Pindar, uh, who wrote public poems, their celebrations. So after the, the Pythian Games or the Olympic Games, he would write a poem celebrating the champion, right? So it was designed to be very public, to be read in public, and uh, often these are in mixed meters. So when you're looking at an ode from Keats, uh, something like the ode on the Grecian urn, he is imitating in the mixed meter of the stanza, the Pindaric ode, right? Uh, on the other hand, he's not doing everything Pindar was doing because again, Pindar's odes were intended to be entirely public. Like here's a crowd, you're gonna say, you know, you know, Hussein Bolt has won the hundred meters. Here's, you know, a hundred lines extolling his glories and tying him to mythological figures. That's sort of the mode of, of Pindar. Right. Uh, the other type, type, other major type of ode, I would say, is, is the Horatian, which is all of Horace's odes are addressed to individuals. So it's not a public performance. They are epistolary in nature. Uh, to a great extent, right? It's it, They're all addressed to one individual, one specific person. And sometimes it's a real person like Mycenas. Sometimes it's a made-up person like Lucono we hear is just a fictional character so far as we know. Um, but it allows for a more intimate speech. And often the meters are irregular just because of the stanzas that he chooses. But uh, in a poem like like this, the meter is 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 quite regular, so it's not like the Pindaric ode at all. It's much more intimate. It's more private, and much shorter, uh, easier to understand, easier to appreciate, and there's far less um, of the recherche in Horace than there is in Pindar. It's it's, a, it's so difficult to translate Pindar because there's so many allusions to just random stuff. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in Horace, it, 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 it tends to be quite avuncular. You know, there are wisdom statements, there's lovely description. Uh, so they're much more accessible. And that's part of the reason, you know, he's been so beloved for a couple of millennia. Um, does that name, Luconoe, signify anything? Well, little Luke would, would point at uh, whiteness. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything in Greek, right? I mean, if we're translating from Greek, Luke... But I don't, I mean, it's just, it could be, well, Noe could be from news, uh, from mind, like, like bright minded could be something like that, which would make sense. Someone who has a bright mind would want to know uh, the future. Uh, I, 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 a, a real Latin scholar would know that. I, I don't, I'm just going to have to speculate. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the the next couple of odes, which uh, we, we don't have to discuss in as much detail, but sure. but uh, they're thematically similar. Can we do two ten? Uh, sure. Yeah, rectius uh, vives. So this is uh, an ode in the Sapphic strophe, uh, named obviously for Sappho, uh, the great love poet of antiquity uh, from the Isle of Lesbos. Uh, our word lesbian comes from her. On the Isle of Lesbos right. in the sixth century, it was uh, very common for female teachers and their female students to be involved in amorous affairs. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sappho was was so beloved and so famous in, in antiquity that she was named uh, the tenth muse. That's what they called her. There are the nine muses, mm -hmm. all the children of Mnemosyne that wow. govern all the arts and sciences. So they almost they they sort of made her a, a demigoddess, uh, making her the tenth muse. She was so beloved. We only have fragments and maybe a couple of whole poems from Sappho, um, and in Latin, her presence really first shows up with Catullus, who is slightly, he's maybe twenty years older than Horace, uh, and Catullus in uh, his Carmina or poem fifty-one translates. Uh, Sappho, uh, the fragment we now number is 31, uh, and so brought the Sapphic strophe into Latin, and uh, and Horace extended that and wrote, I think the second most common form for Horace's odes is the Sapphic strophe, so importing a mm -hmm. Greek form into Latin. And the Sapphic strophe, not to go in too much into meter, I would say it's, it's a quatrain, there are four lines in every stanza. The first three lines have 11 syllables, the fourth line called the Adonic has five. Um, 
So bringing it into English, you want to create something like that effect. So what I do is an iambic pentameter for the first three lines with 10 syllables. And then the fourth line has six uh, normally. Uh, so it's an approximation of the original form. Uh, yeah, here's 210. A better life's not always making for the deeps, Lysenius. Nor is it found cringing with dread when tempests come around and clinging to the shore. Whoever loves the golden mean will shun the squalors of the low, forgotten houses, and also shun the palace that arouses envy in everyone. The tall pines shake most when the high winds shriek. Huge towers come down with the loudest crash, and frequently, the lightning's sudden flash strikes on the highest peak. The well-made heart hopes on the bleakest day, fears on the brightest, that his fate somehow may change. Jove brings back hideous winter now, and now takes it away again. If things are bad now, they will not be so forever. Sometimes Apollo's lyre wakes up the silent muse and his hand tires of stretching his bow taut. Show yourself a man of spirit. Hail when times are hard. And when it's billowing and puffed out from the jolly winds that sing, wisely trim your sail. Um, what can you tell me about this phrase, the well-made heart? <laughs> well, it's, it's a bit of phrase making. Uh, yeah, you know, for 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 Horace, there's as I was mentioning, there's this idea of uh, making one's life beautiful uh, and of self control, right? Circumspection, what the Greeks called sophrosyne. Uh, so, yeah, I took some liberties with the Latin to get the well made heart, uh, but it's 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 more or less more or less accurate to the spirit of the thing. And who's the silent muse here? Apollo's liar wakes up the silent muse. Yeah. So, uh, Apollo is generally thought of uh, as the god of poetry. Uh, however, we learn, especially lyric poetry, he plays the lyre, from which we get the word lyric. Um, he gets the lyre, however, from Hermes Mercury. Uh, in the Homeric hymn to Mercury, uh, we find that Mercury makes the lyre out of a tortoise shell. Uh, and uh, then he, because he's always mischievous, uh, Hermes Mercury is also the god of thieves. Uh, right. So he steals Apollo's cows. And Apollo gets mad and goes to, uh, goes to Jove and, and, and says, Daddy, you know. Somebody stole my cows. And so as a, as a sort of rapprochement, they trade and, and Hermes gives Apollo right. the lyre. And so he becomes the god of poetry. So the muse here is any muse, right? That Apollo is often uh, a very violent god, right? The sunbeams are often described as arrows, as in book one of the, the Iliad, right? Uh, where in a hapax legomenon, uh, Apollo is, is given the vocative epithet of sminthu. A hapax legomenon is a word that occurs only once in an entire language. So hmm. of all the Greek that we have, the only instance of sminthu is in uh, Iliad 1, where it hmm. describes Apollo. It's the mouse god or rat god, scholars think. Uh, but he was the god of plagues, right? If you recall, the plague that besets the Argives is from Apollo. He was a vengeful god. He was a violent god. Uh, hmm. But he had this sort of leisurely aspect too, where he's the god of, of poems, right? And so the idea is that sometimes Apollo quits shooting his arrows at us and killing us. And sometimes he just relaxes and plays, uh, and plays the, uh, the, the lyre. And which muse that would be? Well, uh, Erato would be the muse of lyric poetry. So presumably Erato, yeah. Um, can we go ahead and read 2.14? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so this is the ode to Postume. I took his name out. Uh, he's sort of a fictional character anyway. Uh, and I inserted my friend uh, for a few reasons. Uh, 
we can talk about later. Um, yeah, okay. Go oh, to 14. Ah, oh, no. The years, my friend, they slip away. And nothing, despite all our prayers, can save us from the coming days, wrinkled and gray old age, and the inevitable grave. Slaughter, with each new day that comes around, 300 oxen to the tearless king who keeps Gorion's three huge bodies bound, to tie us to, beyond the sorrowing river which is for all who taste the sweet fruits of the earth to cross when life is done. Princes or paupers, farmers in the wheat. You'll still be Plutos, as will everyone. In vain we flee the blood-stained battlefield, the wild-flung waves on the hoarse storm-rough sea. In vain hope autumn's southern winds will yield and spare our trembling bodies injury. You must seek out the slow and aimless murk of coiled cachitis, and all who descend from Danaeus, and watch the wasted work Sisyphus, the oldest child, does without end. You must forsake the earth, your home, the wife you love. Of all the trees you tended to, doting, the gluttonous cypress, after life, brief gardener, alone will follow you. Your best son carelessly will slosh the wine you guarded with a hundred locks and pour that precious vintage pontiffs when they dine might find divine on an exalted floor. That last that last stanza is one of my favorites in the book uh, on a musical level. It's just delightful. Well, thank you. And I've also just been I've also been texting it to uh, my friends who have small sons. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad you can dishearten all of your friends. That what am I for if not that? Yeah, I mean, and it's also you know, Thomas, this is an example of what I was talking about in terms of syntax. That when said aloud, the stanza sounds perfectly like speech, I think, or approximately enough to give the illusion of it. But reading it, there's some syntactic liberties that are taking place there. Uh, right. And poor that precious vintage, which pontiffs, when they are dining, might find, right? So there's all these sort of elisions in the syntax. There's, a, there's another example in that, that long second sentence. Right. We talked about how you can create a line with an illusory syntax that has a vertical meaning in addition to the literal linear meaning. So line five, slaughter with each new day that comes around. That's the theme. Right. 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 I liked how you be just began the second stanza with slaughter. Yes. Right. And that like, line. Well, ah. That line on its own is the theme of the poem. And we don't realize because of the, the hyperbaton that it is slaughter 300 oxen, right? The direct object is slaughter oxen with the implied subject you. But we just have slaughter with each new day that comes around as a syntactical unit on its own is quite handsome and, and to the point, right, of the poem, even though it's also doing this linear thing as the sentence progresses. So, yeah, there are a lot of syntactical sort of hijinks in this poem uh, to get it to work. The, the sorrowing, uh, beyond the sorrowing, right? Well, the sorrowing is modifying right. river, right? It is, it's, it's describing uh, the, the, the Asheron or the Styx, right, the, in the underworld beyond that river. But you get beyond the sorrowing. Well, the life is filled with sorrow because we're, there's slaughter with each new day that comes around. So you get all these little bits. And then the river, which is, all, is for all who taste the sweet fruits of the earth to cross, that, that long dependent clause, which is for all who taste the sweet fruits of the earth, river to cross. So, yeah, it's a way of, uh, and, and, you know, you can't capture what Horace is doing, but you can create an approximation of some of the right. handsomeness of the individual line within the context of the linear motion of the sentence from line to line. 
Right. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of references in here. I don't want to get bogged down explaining them all. Yeah. Uh, the Cypress. Um, I Googled the Cypress yeah. and uh, apparently it's a short lived tree. So that's that's how I took that. Well, and, and just uh, in, in antiquity, it was associated with the funerary. Um, oh, was, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it was just common. And, and I'm sure that has to do with it being short lived. Uh, just with the origin yeah. of the ancient rituals, but but here, yeah, it so was he just, says. Yeah, of was, all the trees yeah. you tended to, doting the gluttonous cypress, after life, brief gardener alone will follow you. That's yeah. the line that we're referring to. Um, now, a pontiff is not a pope in this Correct. poem. Correct. Um, it is a emperor, I guess, or maybe a is prince. it broader than that? You, you could say a you prince. could say yeah, yeah, a prince, something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it really is interesting when you look closely at these poems about uh, death uh, and fate in Horace. There's this attention, this there's this awareness of death, um, and yet without any real sense of ex escaping the vanity of this life, which is what it, it would be easier at first reading to mistake it for something closer to um, a Christian sense or even, even some other classical perspective, like a, a Socratic – uh, sense or something, but I don't think that that's what it is. No. Yeah, there's no metempsychosis in 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 Horace. Uh, we are we are yeah we are not passing through and returning uh, as in as in Plato. It really is, uh, as I say. I mean, it, it it's very much out of uh, Epicurus. Uh, the idea of, of you know we're made of atoms. We we break apart, uh, and so we have this miracle that we are here now, and let us let us live uh, pleasurable, happy lives while we can. That's that's very much Horace. But in this last in this last poem, we're going to look at by Horace. He he uh, exempts himself a little bit indeed. from this universal law. Um, Ode two twenty. Yes, indeed. So quite different from the previous ones. Yeah. It, so this is um, it's not one of his best poems. It's maybe one of his best known because it's so unusual. Uh, so this is a poem uh, that is in the Alcaic strophe. I mentioned Alcaeus earlier as the guy who also left his shield. So the, the most common meter that Horace uses is the Alcaic strophe, which is the form that Alcaeus invented. He's a, Alcaeus is a contemporary of Sappho, also from the Isle of Lesbos, um, over near uh, what was then Troy, what is still the Bosphorus, uh, modern-day Turkey. Um, so the Alcaic is, the first two lines are like the first two lines of a sapphic strophe. It's the 11 syllable thing. Uh, then the third line is nine syllables and the fourth is 10. Uh, I translate it just as a pentameter quatrain rhymed ABAB. -A so I say it's the most common form in Horace, but one of the important things that's happening here, Horace is very proud of himself for bringing these Greek forms into Latin poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. and so there are multiple levels of transformation happening. There is in this poem, Horace is going to turn into a swan. Uh, mm. and that transformation is bolstered by his transformation of a Greek form into a Latin poem. Uh, right. So that he's, he's having a bit of fun here with the idea of, of transformation. So this is Ode 220, which is, I, I think, inferior to Ode 330. They are both sort of valedictory. They seem like they should be the end, and they are the end of their respective books of Odes. Ode 220. No, no weak wing, no customary wing will bear me through the liquid air. A biform point. I'm done dilly-dallying on earth flown far beyond the jealous eye of cities. No, I, whom you call your friend, Mycenas, I, with all the pauper's blood my parents gave me, I will never end or be imprisoned by the Stygian flood. Already, rough, my legs feel wrinkly skin take hold, and white, I'm turned into a swan on my top half, and downy, growing in my fingers and my shoulders, plumes come on. More famous now than Icarus, that child of Daedalus, where Bosphorus coasts moan, I'll fly, a tuneful bird, 
and through the wild deserts and hyperborean plains unknown, they'll learn the Colchian and the Dacian who pretends our Roman armies stir no fear. They'll learn my name. Scythians will hear it too. Spaniards and drinkers of the Rhone will hear. Don't give my hollow funeral a dirge or your base lamentations or your gloom. Spare the wake's clamor. Don't let honor splurge on the vacuity that is a tomb. You know, so I, I have a little uh, a poetry discussion group going on via Zoom. And by the way, for listeners, uh, we need more people. So if you're interested in taking part, feel free to contact me and I'll 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 be glad to uh, to to invite you. But uh, we're reading Ben Johnson right now. And um, I we just read uh, Ben Johnson's tribute to Shakespeare, and I couldn't help but see, um, as I did with a number of poems in this book, actually, um, in the last stanza, something where I, I think that he says, Shakespeare, you are a monument without a tomb. Yeah. Um, I couldn't help but see that referring to this last stanza here, where he says, uh, you know, don't let honor splurge on the vacuity that is a tomb. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that's a direct influence there? One hundred percent. 100%. Ben Johnson's hero was Horace. He knew Horace in and out. Yeah. He translated Horace. He called himself Horace in one of his plays called The Poetaster. <laughs> he loved Horace. Wow. Definitely. And and okay. that and that stanza is, is imported in, in several other uh, famous poems from English. Alexander Pope, I, I quoted earlier, when he was 11 years old, uh, he wrote an immortal poem uh, called The Ode on Solitude. And the last stanza of hmm. that is derived from the last stanza of this uh, yeah, it, wow. it becomes it becomes sort of a, a common motif in uh, the Renaissance through the the eighteenth century of the poet becoming immortal through his poetry. Well, you know, yeah, it's interesting. I did notice this a bunch of times throughout this collection. You mentioned um, another Horace poem, which we we won't read in the introduction. You mentioned Epode Two, that uh, being an influence to on Penshurst, which I just read last week. Um, and uh, and then there's another one, uh, one of the ancient Greek poems, the Anacreontia, if I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, towards the beginning of the book. Um, there's one and I thought, wow, this is um, a hilarious poem that I've read by uh, Abraham Cooley. Yep. Um, Indeed. Called On Drinking. Or, or drinking. And uh, I actually like, I think Cooley might improve on the <laughs> the original a little bit. It's a little... Uh, more expanded. Uh, it's quite funny, but um, yeah, that was that was an interesting aspect of this book uh, as well. Just the the way that poets had clearly picked up on things, um, and the Petrarch. I think there was a Petrarchan example of that too with um, "Who So Will Who So List to Hunt" yes. by Wyatt. Yep. Um, Good. And this is this is what this book is for. Uh, there are so many all these poems, almost all, especially the older ones. They they they're. I included these specific ones largely because they will help any reader of English poetry to navigate. Yeah, with the with the Anacreontia, yeah, Cooley turned uh, poems from that. Uh, so did Richard Lovelace, uh, another cavalier of that period. Uh, so did Robert Herrick. Um, so did uh, 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 so did Goethe and Byron. Uh, Thomas More, not the not the saint, the 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 Irish lovelorn poet. Two O's. Uh, yeah, yeah, Thomas More with two O's had a, had a bestseller in the early nineteenth century with the Anacreontia. Um, they were very famous. In fact, they yeah. were so famous. Anac the Anacreontia was so famous, and Anacreon was so famous uh, that uh, there was a drinking club in uh, in old England called the uh, Anacreontic Club, and uh, they had a um, they had a club cheer, as all those old old clubs had, and uh, you might recognize the melody. Bum 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 bum. Our national anthem is set to the melody of the Anacreontic Club's drinking cheer. Uh, wow. So yeah, all this stuff comes back, right? It, it, it all comes back. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I hope with this book is that, well, as I say, help readers who may not have, you know, Latin or, or Greek or whatever it is to, to see these influences uh, in English language poetry. So, you know, there's a, a Ronsard poem, uh, Ronsard and the Pleiad in uh, 16th century France. They were also big into the Anacreontia. 
but one of the Ronsard poems in here uh, that I include uh, begins, when you were very old, uh, working your wool, candlelit evenings by the fire. And if you know W.B. Yeats, uh, early poems from the 1890s, uh, he has one that is based on the Ronsard, when you are mm -hmm. old. Um, so yeah, most of these will have uh, cross references in uh, famous English poems. Many of them, I think I've linked in the, or not linked, but uh, put into the notes, maybe not always. But yeah, that is one of the, the, the ambitions I had with the book. What's the mythic significance of Horace turning into a swan specifically? Is it that that's the idea of the swan song? Right. So there, yeah, there's the, there's the strange myth about the swan singing as it dies. Um, the only mm -hmm. time the swan sings is as it dies. And so there's, we talked about the transformation of him into a swan, of G Greek into Latin, but it's also of life into death and of death into life, right? As he, he's mm -hmm. going to die, but his death will be uh, immortal. He will be like the swan. He will be known everywhere because his poems are uh, so good. And, you know, remarkably, Thomas, he called a shot. Uh, let's see, Horace died November 27th, I think, of 8 B.C., so what is that, uh, 2,030 years ago almost? And, and here we are uh, talking Horace. He's pretty close, pretty close to immortality. Not, uh, yeah. not of course, in the, uh, the Christian or Catholic sense, but, but you know, 2,000 years, pretty good. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention about this poem. In the third stanza, you were mentioning this this device of hyperbaton, mm -hmm. and uh, I, 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 again, I don't know Latin really, but um, I was struck by these interjected adjectives and knowing a little bit of Latin and the word order and stuff. I want is that is that a pretty exact uh, replication of the Latin word order, or is it or or is it the exact replication of the way that it sometimes works anyway? Where I, let, let me read the stanza. It's already rough. My legs feel wrinkly skin take hold and white. I'm turned into a swan on my top half and downy growing in my fingers and my shoulders plumes come in. So there, there's those three adjectives that are sort of stuck in there in a way that's different from English, normal English syntax. Yes. And uh, so in, in the original, there's a sense of discovery as, as the stanza is moving. I mean, this is the, the stanza of transformation. And so there's a sense mm -hmm. in, the, in the syntax of sort of discovering and being bewildered and a little, a little off kilter. And you can't capture Horace's word order, but I tried to get something of that effect as if he's sort of looking down and saying, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I, now I, I, you know, I have downiness on my fingers, right? To, to get this sense of um, sort of performative, uh, transformation. It's why I think, you know, many critics, uh, you know, and especially, you know, great classical scholars find this to be an inferior poem. It's, there's something a little bit bathetic or performative about that stanza and about becoming a, a swan on the page. Um, mm. but yeah, I tried to capture, you know, sort of the effect of, of the original, which is, uh, often, you know, what one has to do with Horace, because you can't, you simply can't imitate the word order. So you try to create something that is an approximation of the effect. There is something of desperation to the, <laughs> to the poem. Uh, uh, do we have time to do a little bit of Baudelaire? That sounds good. Well, how, how do we transition into this from, from, uh, you know, quite a, quite a number of years back to, uh, the 19th century. Yeah. Um, well, we could say that, that Baudelaire, uh, like everyone, uh, was, you know, who's a good poet of that time, was was brought up on Greek and Latin. Uh, and, and Baudelaire is, in fact, you know, he's an anti-romantic, uh, which means he's a romantic who doesn't like himself for being a romantic. Um, I think that's sort of fair. Maybe that's too much of a bun mo. Uh, but, Right, so he's not a, a romantic in the way that his predecessors say Lamartine uh, is is a is a is a, is a very romantic, straightforward sort of imitation Wordsworth kind of isn't nature pretty uh, sort of stuff. Baudelaire loves classical beauty, and he looks around him 
in Paris. So he's born 1821. Um, his you know masterpiece, Le Fleur du Mont, comes out in 1857. But he's looking around himself in modern Paris, and there there's no beauty. Uh, it is it is it is very very ugly, and uh, you know it stinks. It's uh, the it's not a sophisticated thing. The the poor, the prostitutes, the the destitute are are everywhere. There's this still there's still despite numerous revolutions, there's still this huge stratification of wealth, um, and so there's a there's a bourgeoisie that is pretending, you know, largely sort of hiding out in the in the country or in exclusive neighborhoods. And they have no sense of the poverty, the squalor that others are living in. And um, so Baudelaire is raised into the bourgeoisie and uh, finds himself immersed in uh, the culture of the very poor and sort of moves between them. That's largely one of his moves, right? The psychopomp moving between worlds. His is between the bourgeoisie and the very poor, uh, and also between the austere beauty of the classical world and the nightmare of, of his time. Uh, we have to remember, you know, the 19th century, I think it's easy to glamorize and idealize we have to remember something like 75% of Europe was addicted to laudanum. Uh, you know, laudanum, the, the, wow. the, the opium and pure alcohol mix. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you had a headache, you would be prescribed laudanum. And if you had a broken arm, you would get a laudanum. And people got hooked on it. Uh, and then there are the opium dens. Uh, so the, the, the opium thing that we're going through is you know, not, not nil. Um, right. There's the the opium, the hashish, the laudanum. People are strung out. Uh, they're addicted. Uh, so yeah, it's just sort of an ugly world, and he longs for this beauty, and he feels himself isolated. Um, and he especially, you know, his hero, his literary hero, is an American, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, whom mm. we treat as very kitschy and. You know, we think of Edgar Allan Poe when we think of Vincent Price and stuffed ravens right. and, and velvet suits and things. But uh, in France, Poe was treated with the utmost respect. He was the great American poet in, in France. Um, wow. And it's because in Poe's poetry, we have very orderly forms, normally a tetrameter couplet or sometimes more elaborate forms, as in The Raven, where we have... Um, you know, catalectic, trochaic, octometer alternating with heptameter and these elaborate forms. This very, very rig rigorous, uh, very logical, orderly forms. But within those orderly forms, there's madness and there's mystery and there's there's this wildness. And uh, and this is what Baudelaire takes from mm. Poe largely. So he writes perfect, beautiful French, uh, the, the classical French Alexandrine, 12 syllables, Kaiser in the middle, everything is classical as, as it is in somebody like Moliere. But the content is opium and prostitutes and lice and gutters and the homeless. And so there's this sense of uh, being a poet almost of, of secrets uh, that... Uh, there's a kind of bourgeois form with this, with this very not bourgeois kind of revolutionary content. There's this elegance of, of music, but there's this terrifying content. Um, yeah, and I'll say it for the listeners, you know, if you if this intrigues you to explore Baudelaire, just be warned. You know, some of his poems are quite disturbing, and and uh, he was exploring evil and exploring, you know, the mystery of iniquity. I guess you could say and. Uh, there's stuff about Satan, and some of it is even, you know, satanic in a sense. He's a very important poet, but um, not always the most uplifting. Well, yeah, and I mean, uh, it's sort of, sort of like Poe. I think it's easier for us to look at Poe as kitschy and not as frightening, perhaps. Uh, but you know, Poe said that the the province of poetry is beauty. Now, it's important, right? Because in in Plato, we have Tudetheon, Kalon. Sophon, Agathon, 
right? The divine is the beautiful, the true, and the good. That's what Plato says. Well, Poe is going to get rid of the good and get rid of the true and make poetry about beauty on its own. And so we get what later writers would call the grotesque, a kind of monomania, an obsession with one particular thing, and it leads to distortion. For Poe, it's beauty, and for Baudelaire, it's beauty. And when you don't counterbalance beauty with wisdom or truth and goodness, you end up with this kind of grotesque figure who's a sort of monomaniac, and both Baudelaire and Poe, I think, could be called that. Yeah, so we're not endorsing everything that he wrote. Do not um, do not become a believer of Charles Baudelaire's beliefs. Do you want to do uh, a lecture or uh, le voir? Uh, the to the reader or the voice? Um, I'll I'll leave that up to you. Well, why I'll don't we do? Why don't we do? Because we've talked about that romantic spirit of of voyaging. Why don't we do uh, le voir, the voice? Um, because it captures quite clearly this dichotomy. That I've been talking about. It's perhaps less compelling than to the reader, uh, a lecture, which is a very, very famous poem. The Voice. My crib was lent against the bookcase, where dim babble, novels, science, fablio, and Latin's ashes with Greek's dusty fare all mingled. I stood tall as a folio. Two voices spoke to me. One, firm and sly, said, Earth's a cake that's full of sweet delight. I, and your pleasure then would never die, can give you a commensurate appetite. The other, oh, in dreams come voyaging beyond the possible, beyond the known. It sang as winds along the shoreline sing, a ghost that out of nowhere makes its moan, fondling the ear and shrouding it in gloom. I answered, yes, sweet voice. From that time dates what one might call, alas, my pain, my doom. Behind the scenery that decorates immense existence, in the black abyss, I see distinctly worlds both strange and real, and victim to ecstatic vision's bliss, I'm plagued by serpents biting at my heel. It's since then that, like prophets long deceased, I so adore the desert and the seas, laugh amid mourners, and weep at the feast, find a smooth taste in bitter wine's last lees. So often take the facts for liars' schemes, and eyes turned heavenward fall into holes. But the voice consoles me, says, look to your dreams. Sages have less of beauty than mad souls. That's probably my favorite of the Baudelaire poems um, in the in the collection. Um, I mean, to the reader is, as you said, quite compelling. But in terms of the in terms of what it says, I am more sympathetic to uh, the voice. I would say. Yeah. Well, and 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 what he's what he's driving at here, right? This romantic impulse. I talk about when you split the ratio from the intellectus, and you have this pure reason. You get this very formulaic. You, you get a clockwork universe, right? And for a poet, that's sort of intolerable because, and and Baudelaire was a Catholic. We should say. There's, there's a wildness to God. There is a wildness and a mystery to God that pure mm-hmm. ratio, pure reason cannot handle. You know, if I may be permitted to quote uh, a, a Lutheran theologian, uh, Ter Stegen, he says, Ein begriffener Gott ist kein Gott. An understood God is not God, or a comprehended God mm-hmm. is not God. Maybe that's a better translation. That is right. a full comp- If you think you fully comprehended God, you don't have God. 
you, you, you have created a false God. You've made an idol. God is so much wild or so much greater than our understanding. We have scripture to help us. We have the fathers to help us. But no one can hold that. No one can possess the immensity, the variety, the wonder, the, the impossible. You, you, a creature cannot comprehend its, its, its creator. It's, it's too big. It's too, there's too much. And uh, so just sort of reducing the world into, well, I've got you know, my very nice suit and I've got my very orderly job and everything is in order and everything makes sense and I'm very comfortable and the world is perfectly reasonable. That was unacceptable mm-hmm. to Baudelaire. And I think it's unacceptable to anyone with any religious impulse. Uh, it doesn't have to be right. even Christian. A religious impulse recognizes the wildness of the world the fecundity of the world and the limitation of human knowledge. Uh, so for the YouTube viewer, if uh, people are wondering why things might, the light might look slightly different or something like that, it's because we we had a, a technical issue and uh, and had to come back the next day to wrap up. We were just about to finish anyway. Um, so Ryan, I, I have a, one more sort of general question. Um, I wish we had more time to spend on the French, but uh, obviously we could have done this for 10 or, or 50 hours, but right. yes. <laughs> we can't, we can't go forever. Um, so uh, going back to Horace and, and classical literature, I'm, I'm just curious how you as a Catholic relate to classical literature, uh, not so much philosophy. I mean, it, that ground is pretty well tread. I'm more thinking about things like um, lyric poetry and not even so much the, the narrative uh, stuff. Um, but uh, with a poet like Horace, I mean, we were talking about some of the shortcomings of his his personality, his philosophy. Um, so, so what do you get as a Catholic, uh, perhaps to narrow it down, from a poet like Horace? Well, I mean, primary uh, my primary interest would just be in the uh, the execution of the the poem. Um, mm. the, the poetry is as well made as any poetry anyone has ever written. Uh, it is, mm. it is perfect and it is beautiful. Uh, and, uh, so when, when, when I am reading classical literature, I'm not approaching it, uh, from a position of seeking philosophical agreement or self aggrandizement. Uh, it is with a, a, a spirit of caritas and, uh, taking the writers for who they were. They had shortcomings. I have shortcomings. Uh, but if a poem is beautiful, a poem is beautiful. Even if one doesn't necessarily agree with the theme, one can admire how the diction, the syntax, and all the various patterns, the imagery, uh, work together in harmony, uh, to embody, uh, that theme. So, you know, there's not, uh, for me, I'm not terribly interested in, in, in any sort of, uh, syncretism in a literal way, uh, you know, in the way that sort of Milton does. I, that that doesn't interest me uh, as much as thinking analogically, right? I think that there's a way that we can we can look back at, um, you know, sort of the Olympian pantheon and try to have a very literalistic one to one. Sort of like a metaphor, saying this is this, and and I don't think that works very well. I think more uh, something along the lines of a simile, where you say, "Well, this is like this." Uh, there are similarities, right? So, um, with Heracles, for instance, right, who is often taken as a kind of Christ figure, you could say, "Well, so sure, we see some sorts of similarities." So, for instance, in Euripides' play Alcestis. Uh, Right, uh, 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 Admetus, uh, who is a king, is a great friend of Heracles, and uh, anyway, his wife is dying and has just died when Heracles arrives. And Heracles says, "Hey, good buddy," and so practicing Xenia, Admetus says, "Hey, you know, it's good to see you." But Heracles is is just sort of boisterous and wants to get very drunk and make merry, and uh, Admetus sort of allows this. And then, so when Heracles discovers what's happened that uh, Alcestis has died, Admetus' wife, Alcestis has died, he goes down into Hades and rescues her and brings her back from the dead. And we say, wow, a figure who resurrects the dead. That, that is similar to 
that is similar to Christ. But if you say, you know, it is, right, uh, then it, it falls apart. It becomes very flimsy. So I think there's sort of thinking about uh, those myths uh, as analogies for uh, psychic or spiritual movements is helpful. And then, as I say, just the, the actual body of the text and how perfectly uh, some of these poems are made, they can be um, not just instructive to uh, the poet or uh, the critic or the translator, but also um, things of wonder in their own right. Anything that's beautiful uh, has an element of, of, of wonder to it and has an element of uh, God's glory to it. Um, so is your uh, is your approach as a classicist then, is it different in that respect from some approaches, say, of people in the Renaissance, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I mean, and there, there are various approaches, right? But we see right. a sort of concerted effort in a, in a point like Milton toward a, a genuine syncretism of mm. uh, the, the Hebraic uh, and Judeo-Christian tradition with the Greco-Roman tradition. Um, and as I say, I mean, to me, that feels a little bit tenuous. Uh, I think others around, you know, others in the Renaissance wore it very lightly. I think, you know, I should not uh, consider myself in the same sentence with Shakespeare. But Shakespeare, right, he uses a lot of, uh, you know, antiquity uh, and will rely on sort of mythical persona, persona from time to time. But he, he's clearly not taking it very seriously as a, you know, uh, as a literal phenomenon, they they become symbols. They become analogs uh, for, I think, you know, as I say, uh, spiritual movements, psychic movements that are uh, much more general than specific to a particular time, a place, or culture. I see. Okay, well, um, Ryan, I wonder if I might. Uh... I, I definitely want to have you back on when you when your next volume of originals uh, comes out, sure. which you don't have a you don't have a date for that uh, yet, do you? Right, I do not. I suspect it will be twenty four. Uh, the series that is running the book only does two books a year, and I know there's at least one already slated for twenty three, if not both for twenty three. So I okay. expect twenty four. So upcoming, you have the. Um, you have the uh, gosh, uh, the the uh, Christian contemporary Christian poetry anthology that you're editing. Uh, contemporary Catholic um, poets, in, uh, yes. Exactly. Sorry, contemporary Catholic poetry yeah. in 2023 spring, yes. and then in 2024, uh, the Ghost Light. That's going to be your original. Yes, uh, uh, I, I believe that is correct. Collection. And and I should mention okay. that there is uh, there is a contemporary Christian poetry, Christian poetry in America since 1940, an anthology. Uh, edited by Micah Maddox uh, hmm. uh, and uh, Sally Thomas, that is coming out with the same press that's doing the contemporary Catholic poetry. That is, uh, I see. That is Paraclete Press, and the now, Christian it, now poetry is will the be contemporary out. Christian one going to be including Catholic poetry yes. or excluding yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Several. Okay. Uh, so Dana Joya, uh, my late friend gotcha. Franz Wright, uh, James Matthew Wilson, myself. And maybe one or two other Catholics are in this. And that will be out in September, I believe. Okay, great. Well, Ryan, I wonder if I could ask uh, if you'd be interested in reading one more original poem sure. for us before we go. Um, namely, one of my favorites, a, a very fun one, and, and one that's appropriate since it does draw on the classical legacy, um, Philoctetes. Right, yes. So uh, I have I have a note in the back of the manuscript that introduces this poem more succinctly than I could do extemporaneously. So I'll read the note uh, as that may. And, and this is going to be in the upcoming volume, yes, the Ghost Light. Yes, this will be in Ghost Light, right? But I've heard you read it. I heard you read it at a at a reading, which is why I know about that's it. right. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, so here's the note in the back of Ghost Light. Um, I don't know if it will be in the final version, but anyway. So Philoctetes was an Argive hero from Thessaly. Due to a foul-smelling wound on his foot, he was abandoned on the Isle of Lemnos by Odysseus and company en route to Troy. And he lived ten years alone in the wilderness before the prophet Calchas prophesied the Argives could not win the Trojan War without him, and the magical bow, which could not miss its target, that he had been given by Heracles prior to that demigod's death. Upon this prophecy, Odysseus and Pyrrhus, son of the late Achilles, sailed to Limnos to persuade Philoctetes to rejoin their forces. He resisted their entreaties until, in Sophocles' play named for him, 
Philoctetes was confronted by Heracles, risen from the dead in a deus ex machina, that resolves the conflict. Uh, Philoctetes is mentioned briefly in the Iliad. I believe it's in book one. Right. Uh, yeah. So a few other notes that might be pertinent. Lethe is the river of forgetfulness in the Elysian fields of Hades, the classical realm of the dead that we've mentioned. Uh, and traditionally, Philoctetes is the one who kills Paris Alexandros uh, with the infallible bow and arrow. Uh, for the and this poem is is taking him into a modern context. That's right. Yes, uh, it is Philoctetes. Uh, the title is Philoctetes Long Afterward, uh, but the idea is um, this hero, this person who has done great deeds, is has survived into the modern era. I was reading in uh, the local paper from uh, where I grew up in Georgia, uh, and uh, there was a uh, they always do a flashback to news from ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, and there was a a woman who had been uh, born in eighteen ninety eight. And uh, she was a doctor, and she continued practicing until she was 103, so in 2001. And she lived till 2012. And I thought, mm. holy moly, what changes in the world she had seen. And uh, I, I felt this similarly with, um, you know, the, the veterans who are still around from World War II, uh, the mm -hmm. things that they have seen and how the world has changed. And what would it feel like to be sort of, the last one left, or one of the last ones left. So this is Philoctetes long afterward. Oh, uh, one other note was, uh, I mentioned an argument between Achilles and Agamemnon. Uh, that, of course, is in the first book of the Iliad, the very famous sort of, right. yeah. Okay, Philoctetes long afterward. They're nice to me, I guess. These ghosts who never know quite what to say having lived out meaningless lives here in Thessaly. They fear each day that they have been somehow defrauded. But bring me my delauded out on the sunny terrace anyway in their soft shoes and scrubs. They putter forward into their futures while helping us into tubs or pushing lethean pills to coax a smile from us, who see played on these plains once more, our ancient pains. The green, a stage that holds Troy's burning pile. It's like some movie set, this hospice. We're the actors, they're the crew. They bring our Percocet and coffee, do the lights. What do we do? We act like we are still the men we were at that time when our lives still mattered. Could be worse. It's true, time's poison ravages the body. But what are gout and diabetes to one who knows what he is? What he was? What can they be to Philoctetes? I am the man who slaughtered Paris for his crime. Here, on a terrace in a wheelchair, dribbling milk from soggy weeds, browbeaten by these ghosts who have never lived. Here's the survivor's fate, and always with the ghost. My own dead friend came to equivocate for Pyrrhus and Odysseus, and he made such a fuss that I slouched off to fight for men I hate. For what? Lo, my reward for saving the Achaeans with my bow? Greg Agamemnon, Lord of Men, long dead. Achilles, too, laid low. And no one cares what they debated or how manipulated I left where Limno's sleepy breezes blow as soft as Mother Peace upon the fevered brow of her sick child who's sick with the disease of life. They could have left me in the wild where I'd hobble from my quiet cave, like Lazarus from the grave, my dying and my living reconciled, as in some afterlife I could not end, since ending it would mean another afterlife. I've never seen such darkly brilliant green, living on bread the raven's broth, and the few fish I caught, things I'd ignored for years, took on 
the sheen of jeweled seas at noon. The deep down stir of things made evident while I lay in a swoon on a stone ledge above the forest, bent over a sprig of thyme, white capped, as if some breaker lapped within the limestone shelf its growth had rent. The changeful days were changeless, and I was most alive when numbered dead, when the unexpected angels of daily observation crowned my head as mayflies form a halo over a lily in the clover nobody's ever seen. But now, instead of that, the TV blares. I email different people. Memory fades. They're dying. No one cares. They feed us burnt steaks. We wield plastic blades and wish we'd known the naive joy of those love felled at Troy, who don't now live as shade among the shades. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Thomas. That was great. Um, you know, uh, talking to you has uh, reminded me, and, and you'll... I think take this as a compliment uh, of my first interview that I did with Samuel Hazo um, because he, like you, um, we were talking about his book on Maritan a couple of years ago and, and he was explaining the concepts in a completely different way. Uh, the same ideas in a completely different way than he did in the book. So it was totally fresh. It wasn't like I was having to sit and listen to, you know, the same thing I had just read. Yes. And so with you talking about the ideas in your essays, you came at them in a whole different context in a whole new way. So that was really enjoyable. And, and like you also, he was able to, to illustrate um, his points with, you know, summed up a uh, memory of one of his or somebody else's poems. So, so that was a really, a real delight. I feel like, uh, we could have gone on forever. So thank you. Yeah. What a, what a pleasure. Uh, and by the way, I, I did want to mention, um, for, uh, audience members of yours who may feel uncomfortable with poetry, uh, my great friend Brad Lighthouser has a new book out that is just for exactly that sort of thing. Uh, it is called Rhymes Rooms. Uh, it's just out from Knopf, and uh, it's a beautiful book, and it's very easy to read, and it will help anyone to understand how uh, poetry is put together. So I thought I'd give great, Brad great. A, a, a shout. Okay. Thanks so much, Thomas. Great. Yeah, thank you. And let me remind people that uh, if you'd like to you know, get more of Ryan's uh Ryan's poetic wisdom. You can always sign up for the the MFA program at the University of Saint Thomas, which is a, a remote learning program, and so you don't have to be there in person. You don't have to be in Houston uh, to do that. And let me remind people again: the book, the most recent book by Ryan, is Proteus Bound, collected tra selected translations, two thousand eight to twenty twenty, and uh, it's got a great variety, far more than what we discussed here. We we talked we we just read a very small selection here. So there's everything from, you know, Saint Francis of Assisi to Baudelaire to um, to Virgil and everything in between. Uh, Ryan, it was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. Have a good evening. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. If you've been watching on YouTube, please do subscribe, and I'll see you next time. 